Okay, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our first apostasy conference hosted by Faith to Faithless, which is an apostate service provided by Humanist UK. I'm Terry O'Sullivan, the chair of Faith to Faithless, and I'm an apostate myself. Um, I can see many familiar faces here today and also many that I don't know. So it's really heartwarming to see so many people interested in this important topic of the harm that apostates face and the difficulties faced by them in accessing support. 20 years ago, when I left the Jehovah's Witness religion myself, there was nothing available at all to apostates and there were very little resources available online as the internet was still in its infancy at that point. And I found uh, no one really understood the issues that I was facing. Today, we see a large number of grassroots organizations filling that void. And there are many of those activists in the audience today who are offering support to apostates when they need it the most. We also continually see larger numbers of researchers entering the field to study the issues that apostates face. And finally, we are seeing a surge of interest in the media and filming organisations who want to publicise the plight of apostates. So things certainly are improving. However, apostates can face a range of issues such as total isolation, dips in their mental health, homelessness, threats to their safety and to their life and much more. So clearly there is much more work that needs to be done. And it's really wonderful to see so many here who want to be a part of that crowd that says to apostates, you are not alone and we are here to help. In the last few days, we've conducted three roundtable events where we've put our brains together and talked about the research and resources currently available to apostates and what is still very much needed. This has been incredibly helpful and we at Faith to Faithless will be compiling a report of our findings, which will be presented to policymakers as they address the needs specifically of apostates when it comes to how we tackle hate crime. And thank you to those who took part in these lively discussions, and we hope that this goes towards making a difference in the lives of those soon to leave high control religious communities. A final word of what we mean when we say apostate, you may find that some religious groups have changed the meaning of the word apostate and turned it into something that vilifies us. Please don't be frightened of the word apostate today. It really only means someone who leaves a religious group. It does not mean that you are evil. It does not mean that you are suppressive. It does not mean you're an activist even. It just means you left a religious group. And we at Faith to Faithless focus on apostates that leave a religious group and do not immediately join another religion. Today, there are many apostates in the audience and you may find that some of the discussions we have today can be upsetting. This is perfectly normal. Do not worry if you need to switch off or walk away for a bit. We at Faith to Faithless do actually offer guided peer support sessions and we also offer online socials at the moment. All apostates are welcome to these and a link will be provided in the chat. There will be spaces for people to ask questions um, of the speakers at some point, at points today, but please do bear in mind that these sections are not for going fully in depth into apostate stories. Not at all because we're not interested in these stories, we most certainly are, but we would not have the time in these sections for this. But if you do want to share your story with those who understand and can relate, please do consider joining us for our socials or peer support sessions and you will be most welcome. And what we're going to do now, let me just uh, check that's okay. Yep. Um, is um, we're going to play a video of, of one of Humanist UK's vice presidents, who's the well known theoretical physicist and supporter of the work that we are doing at Faith to Faithless, Professor Jim Al Khalili. So I think we've got that lined up. So we should be able to hear what he has to say about today. As one of Humanist UK's Vice Presidents, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you all to this Humanist UK's first conference on apostasy. I know the programme covers a range of difficult and emotive topics, like how apostates' needs are not met by a variety of services when the apostate is in crisis, or what the effects are for those who leave high control environments and cults, how lives can be shattered and what we all need to do to support them to put those lives back together. 
I hope that the next few hours will be enlightening, useful and inspiring and that we can all use this event and the contributions that you will all make to make the lives of apostates just a little easier. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Jim. That's a, a, a really nice heartwarming message. Thank you. And then that just now leads us finally to introduce um, our Chief Executive of Humanist UK, Andrew Copson, who will be delivering our keynote address for today on the topic of the rights of apostates and why we fight for them. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Terry. I hope that keynote address isn't too um, elevated a description for the uh, 10 minutes or so that I'm going to uh, be speaking to you. I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in the organising of this conference. Um, I know that Faith to Faithless, like many other apostate programmes and organisations, has been organising events for some years now, but this is the first conference of this type that can bring together apostates, policymakers, researchers, people who work in different organisations. It's great that the roundtables have been so successful and it's wonderful that uh, you're all here today and so nice to see so many friends and colleagues and people that I've been privileged to meet who are apostates themselves um, in the last few years amongst the audience today. As a third or even fourth generation humanist, I have no personal experience of what it is like to have to walk away uh, from a family, from a community, um, because of a growing lack of shared beliefs. But in the last few years, meeting, talking with, hearing from, uh, and beginning to imagine uh, through empathy and, and through listening to the experiences uh, that they've had of so many apostates, um, I really do admire and appreciate and uh, have enormous empathy with uh, and solidarity with the experience um, of those of you who are in that position and the courage and strength of character and inner resources that I know you'll have to draw on um, in uh, living with integrity and with confidence, uh, with the beliefs so different from the beliefs that uh, you might have been raised in. My name is Andrew Copson. I am uh, Chief Executive of Humanist UK. Humanist UK is the national organisation uh, working on behalf of humanists and other non-religious people with similar world views in the UK. We've been doing so for 125 years. This year is our 125th anniversary. And of all the values that humanists hold dear, freedom of thought, um, together with freedom of expression, uh, must surely be um, of the highest importance. The freedom of each person to have access to a wide range of thoughts and ideas, to think critically and to come to their own view on matters, especially the most profound and fundamental matters um, that you know, have to do with the questions that human beings have asked ourselves ever since we became conscious and aware in this universe. Um, that freedom uh, has an enormous importance, not just for society and for human progress. It is freedom of thought that drives forward uh, science, technology, our growing understanding, our social development uh, and cooperation and evolution. Um, it's certainly vital freedom of thought and expression for all those things but it's also vital for individual well-being human beings cannot live a happy fulfilling integrated life if they do not have the basic freedom of thought and belief that in the past humanist philosophers and others have celebrated and developed as a concept and that in our present is a protected human right Freedom of thought, conscience and religion or belief is a protected human right, not only internationally through universal, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other enforceable legal mechanisms. It's a human right in the United Kingdom, in the domestic law of the United Kingdom, and has been ever since um, the Human Rights Act in 1998, which Humanist UK was among the organisations supporting and promoting. The Human Rights Act brought the freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief into our domestic law. It's an enforceable legal right that every single person, not just even citizen, but every single person within the borders of the UK has. A lot of what Humanist UK does is legal, political, and related advocacy. And so a lot of our work focuses on that human right. We focus in particular on the fact 
that that human right includes and entails the right to change your beliefs, to live without fear if you change your beliefs, and to have access to the resources that will allow you to change your beliefs. So we speak out uh, in different policy settings, both at home and abroad, uh, in areas like education and the criminal law um, and in the constitution and in social policy, in, in advocacy of that human right getting greater protection. That involves increasingly speaking out in social areas in favour of individual apostates, in support of individual apostates' right to exercise uh, their freedom in that respect. That advocacy work is important. It's part of what human care has done for the last 125 years. It's part of what we'll all, always do. But increasingly, we know that the journey for individual apostates is long, difficult, and that they stand in need, you stand in need, of individual and specific support. So we're branching out further and further now away from the legal and political work that has been our bread and butter in the past into individual support. And I was really pleased to hear Terry mention some of those uh, programs and activities at the beginning um, of your session today, um, the, the peer support that is offered, the social support that is offered. And we're really pleased to have been able recently as a result of our strategic review to provide Faith to Faithers with new full-time staff that will expand these activities and to build the funding and research base that we need to provide that sort of individual support. So in both these ways, in political advocacy and legal advocacy, and in the offering of ever more dedicated and bespoke support to individuals through our community services, Humanist UK is, is standing ready and working hard to try and improve the lives of apostates in the UK and abroad. That's an important commitment for me. It's an important commitment for all the board and staff of Humanist UK who have put apostate support at the centre of our new strategy. Today is just a first step um, in what I hope will be uh, a very inclusive and broad journey in which we can cooperate with people from all different traditions uh, and all different services. And I know that that's embodied also in the attendance today. Thank you for being here, therefore. Uh, thank you for all the things that you've done so far. Thank you for sharing with us your expertise and wisdom and experiences. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Yes, yeah, so thank you for that, Andrew. That was really lovely. Um, what we're going to do now is going to go into our first plenary, um, which is um, setting the theme, what do we know, lessons that, um, and also lessons that we can learn from the Family Survival Trust. And we have a representative from the Family Survival Trust with us today, Dr. Joy Cranham. And with her joins us Dr. Alejandro Sanchez, Harry Perek, and this will be chaired by Imtiaz Shams. So Imtiaz, I will pass this over to you. I'm Imtiaz, I'm one of the founders of Faith to Faithless, currently on the leadership team, and I also happen to be a trustee of Humanist UK. I'm very excited about this conference. It's been years in planning, um, and obviously COVID has thrown that uh, a spanner in that work, but uh, very excited that this is happening now. So with research, a lot of research up to now has focused on the narrative or theology of apostasy, or for example, you know, what is it that apostasies go through in terms of personal experiences. And, and you know, many of these things are important, but you know, we're at Fate of Phyllis not as interested in the theology, but actually into the harm. What is it that apostates face in terms of harm and, and how um, does it affect their lives and the, and the outcomes of their lives, particularly in relationship in this session to services and such. Um, now there are bits and pieces of research out there in the world, uh, often done by PhD candidates when it comes to the impact of apostasy on, uh, on apostates. But this research is very, very hard to get a hold of. Um, so uh, one of the things that we want to get out of this session and this conference is this is a bit of an opening salvo for us um, to draw together some of the research that's already definitely been done but also to stimulate sort of further research in this area that we think is, is very, very important. Um, as a reminder, the final session of, of this conference today is actually about what areas research could go into in the future. So if you're interested in that, please uh, hold, hold tight for that final um, session as well. Um, I'm not gonna talk for too much longer. I'm just gonna do some quick introductions of the speakers today. So 
Dr. Joy Cranham from the Family Survival Trust is an expert in safeguarding and cult behaviors. And the Family Survival Trust uh, basically is a charity, it's a registered charity with a mission to prevent and give information about coercive control, cult-like behaviors and sort of psychological manipulation. We've also got uh, Alejandro, who is a retired medical doctor and, uh, and did a degree in neuroscience. He joined Fate to Fatalist uh, really to think about and help us with promoting the rights of apostates in the UK, but also supporting um, research on the system, like the systemic discrimination that apostates face when it comes to services, which is why he's in this session, because that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, finally, we've got Harry. Harry has been with Fate to Fatalist for a very long time. He's uh, He's, he's got a long time background in psychology. His, his current PhD research is explicitly looking at the link between apostasy and homelessness. He was also involved in one of the first projects uh, that we were involved in uh, helping him with to do with um, apostasy and, uh, and, and what apostates go through. So I'm very excited to have them on this, on this, um, on this chat, research on this. Um, great, so we've got the next speaker joining now. Um, Alejandro, um, who's just loaded up on my screen, um, you've got about six to seven minutes, and then we've got Harry for about six minutes as well, and then we'll go to the Q and A. Uh, over to you, Alejandro. All right. Thanks so much for that, Joy, and thanks for the introduction, in Uh So, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Alejandro Sanchez, and I've been a volunteer researcher with Faith the Faithless since February. Uh, a small group of us have been investigating three questions. How many apostates are there in the UK? Do organizations embed the rights of apostates in their policies? And what are the systemic barriers to apostates accessing services? So why these three questions? Firstly, to advocate on behalf of a group, you need to know how many people are in that group. Service providers also need this number to plan and implement their services. Secondly, one of our goals at Faith to Faithless is to support apostates in accessing services that are specific to their needs. We need to know, one, do these services exist? And two, if they do, what is stopping apostates from using them? So let's examine each question in turn. How many apostates are there in the UK? So for our purposes, anyone who faced serious ramifications for leaving a high control religion qualifies as an apostate. But in the absence of an explicit census question, are you an apostate? A specific, a specific number remains elusive. However, we can make inferences from incomplete data. The British Social Attitude Survey, number 36, which was published in 2019, suggests that one third of people in the UK are formerly religious. Unfortunately, we can't know how many of these individuals would qualify specifically as apostates. Comparative international studies may be of use. So for example, the Pew Research Center data uh, from the US in 2015 showed that only 34% of individuals raised in the Jehovah's Witness faith still identified with their childhood religion. This suggests within certain religions, at least, that apostasy rates may be remarkably high. And similarly, a Cato Institute report uh, has an American sociologist, Darren Sherkat, estimating that 32% of those raised Muslim in the US will become apostates. That would equate to around a million of the UK's three million Muslims eventually becoming apostate provided a shared definition of apostasy. And data from our own focus groups suggests that there's roughly one closeted apostate for every two out apostates in the community. So if a number of out apostates in the UK was ever successfully calculated, there may be an additional 50% more closeted apostates. So in summary, we don't know how many apostates there are in the UK. However, extrapolating from some of these trends, it seems reasonable to conclude that one, there is a non-insignificant number, and two, if religiosity continues to fall in the UK, that that number may rise in the future. Next, do organizations embed the rights of apostates in their policies? 
So we started with a desktop analysis of 20 organizations whose services might be relevant to apostates. Of those 20, we found just two specifically acknowledged apostates in their written policies. And that isn't to say categorically that the others don't. It's just that we weren't able to find any evidence to that effect. So the two uh, with specific policies were the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, and the Home Office. And although these aren't service providers per se, they're likely to serve as gateways to other services, and their policies may go on to inform those of other organizations. So the CPS includes converts and apostates uh, in their religious hate crime prosecution guidance. And in their 2020 summary of victims' rights, right number four includes the right to have services and support tailored to your needs. And our preliminary discussions with the CPS suggest that this right is underpinned by statute, although we're still seeking further clarification on this topic. Likewise, in their 2019 asylum interview guidance, the Home Office says, apostates should not be expected to have a detailed understanding of the history or philosophy behind a non-religious belief system. Now, some of the organizations that didn't explicitly mention apostates do provide services to victims of honor-based violence. This may be a way of alluding to the persecution some apostates face without broaching the potentially radioactive topic of apostasy itself. And many of the organizations we examined included the rights of those without religion in their policies. They may feel that this includes apostates, or they may not be aware of apostates as a distinct subsection of those without religion. So we're now in the process of emailing and telephoning organizations to ask them if they've considered the needs of apostates, and if not, would they be willing to engage with Faith to Faithless to do so? So broadly speaking, no. And finally, what are the systemic barriers to apostates accessing services? So in the UK, protection for apostates is enshrined in the Equality Act 2010. However, religion's privileged position in our society threatens that protection. Religious organizations play a major role in sectors such as education and drug and alcohol rehab services. And religious individuals may enjoy preferential treatment, such as in housing allocation. So let's examine each of these in turn. We know that 34% of schools in England are faith schools. Many of these schools can discriminate in their enrollment and employment policies on religious grounds. And apostate students attending these schools may feel coerced into participating in collective worship, for example, and they may be marginalized should they seek exemption. There are also 135 faith-based alcohol treatment providers in the UK. Up to 34% of these make religious participation, participation mandatory, and apostates may face overt or implicit proselytization. Additionally, apostates may experience indirect discrimination in accessing social housing after a 2019 Supreme Court ruling permitted pri prioritization based on religion. And this is underpinned by Section 158 of the Equality Act, which allows for restrictions on protections, provided that restriction is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And finally, some anecdotal evidence of barriers uh, have arose from our roundtable discussion uh, this conference and they suggest a number of potential barriers that are worth investigating. Uh, so for example, apparently many mental health professionals in the UK don't have an adequate understanding of religious trauma. And in some cases, patients are having to educate their own therapists on the topic. Uh, we've also heard reports of police being reluctant to engage uh, in cases involving religious communities for fear of being accused of, for example, Islamophobic. So in summary then, we don't know how many uh, apostates there are in the UK, but it's likely to be a non-insignificant non number. Uh, the majority of 
organizations we looked into didn't embed the rights of a policy apostates in their policies and there continues to be a number of barriers to accessing services particularly in education rehab and potentially housing many thanks for your time great thank you alejandro that was really interesting um i found the little piece you had about that person trying to apply for housing that was sort of sanctioned to religious very interesting yeah. um thank you for that uh, we're just going to move over to harry in a second there was a question that's come up about uh just asking how many people are here i think audience members can't see that there's about 55 people um watching at the moment and it goes up and down a little bit um the reason we've not had people's faces up is because um it's quite a um, security conscious decision on our part not to have audience faces on here and names. Uh, well, audience faces, sorry. Um, however, this is our first conference. So ho hopefully the next conference will either be in person or if it is online like this, uh, we'll be able to do something about that if, if security allows that. Great. Um, so, well, in the meanwhile, um, I'll go through another question that had come up earlier which was um, basically saying um, Andrew Copson's introductory speech is an excellent explanation of the rationale underlying humanism. If agreeable, could a copy of this video speech be made available? So the whole conference has been recorded. Not everything will be released, but um, where we can, we will be releasing things. Great, Harry, we can see. So I'm going to shut that works, down. That works. I'll leave it to you. Great. Great. I, should probably, I should probably say thank you for the introduction, but just clarify that um, my name is Harry Perek. I'm a trainee clinical psychologist at the University of Liverpool. I'm also director for trainees for the Association of Clinical Psychologists UK. The research MTRs mentioned on apostasy and homelessness is a project I'm doing with the Open University. Um, we're still recruiting participants for that to understand the difficulties faced. My doctoral thesis at the moment is looking at the, um, the concerns of people being killed by the state for identifying as non-religious within nation states and the reasons why. So without further ado, um, I'm very conscious of time and we uh, just look after yourself basically throughout the day. So when we look at apostasy and we look at this, the issues around it, we have to understand what it's about. Uh, throughout my experience of work with, with non-religious people and religious people, it's this notion of, oh, why can't you just lead the religious faith? It's, you know, it's just stupidity or it's, it's silly or it's idiotic or it's this. And actually, we really have to come from a psychological, pers psychological perspective and understand that this forms somebody's identity. And as a result of the formation of someone's identity, religion, culture, tradition, it's like a tripartite means of how, of, 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 of importance to how somebody sees themselves, people around them and the world around them as well. And a person's identity is really important because it's from that, if we use a Gilbert model, that we actually provide a sense of soothing or strength or safety or security um, from harm. And it provides us with the motivation to do what we want to do in life as well. So we have to kind of take it on a, on a, on a value of understanding why there's a distinction and what, why, the, why it's still important and significant. But the issue here is, is that what happens if there's a, you know, if there's difference? And this is where apostasy comes in. Now, I'm not going to go through what it is and how it is, because you would have got, gathered that from the conference today, but really just to highlight that leaving a religious faith is an arduous process, and this is really tricky and difficult to do and complicated as well. And it, and it covers all of the kind of uh, stage, stages of grief, I, um, in, in all honesty, based on the view that you're losing an attachment relationship to a figurehead, to a community, to the way that people perceive you too. And we only have to understand, we only have to look at the research at the moment that's been done and, and view how people who leave a religious faith or question the religious faith, which is mostly the religious folk, because you have to be religious to leave it, um, are therefore affected by things like blasphemy laws, um, which is what my doctoral thesis is looking at. So why is apostasy a concern? Now, I was very fortunate to do a publication, uh, well, to release a publication last year to look at apostates as a hidden population of abuse victims. And basically we were able to sample 228 people from 30 different nation states. And the, and the research initially showed us what we're seeing in society at the moment, that there is a 
you know, people are becoming less religious. So from the 130 that were Christian, um, only 12, uh, 12, only 12 are currently Christian now. And from the 68 that were only four are now. So there's a high proportion significantly of people that were must um, just, just be with me on the, on the, just be aware of, of those figures. I'll come back to them there, but we're showing that this trend is occurring in a 1,033% increase in non-religiosity too. Now, to go into the stats and what we actually found of the 228 people that we that we sampled, more the more uh, statistically significant uh, result was for Muslim um, for people that are identifying as Muslim to leave their religious faith. So it's more statistically significant for that. And the conflict tactic scale uh, comprises of three areas: uh, assault, serious assault, and psychological abuse. And in all three, it was more statistically significant for people from a Muslim background to face abuse in those areas. Um, there was a fourth dimension, which is called negotiation, which was insignificant for the notion or the question from, from us as researchers was that, is it that people are really, really annoyed that you're non-religious or, or is it a notion of reaction or a threat reaction of going, what do I do? My child is no longer religious. I know all of these things happen. If you're not, what do I do? I can't protect them. And therefore you get this sense of desperation and threat from a household or community or family. Now, we, I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to be quick. But we also looked at this view of, um, have people been able to inform the police of it? And out of the stats of showing, yeah, you know, these are the proportion of people that report their assault to the police. These people believe that it'd be disrespectful and people believe that the police would be unable to support them and that there would be repercussions if they were. Now, usually we would then go, let's blame the police because that's where, you know, they're not able to do their job very well worldwide, this is. But actually, we've also got to look at the way that these groups are formed and the insular nature of these groups and whether the police would ever be able to impart within them. And we have to understand to a point that the social environment by which people are around is playing a role in the amount of power and the amount of, uh, the amount of strength and, and ability that those people have to hold their gumption or do something about it. They have a limited amount of power by being an apostate, by leaving, by becoming homeless, by being shunned. And as a result of that, it means that they're less likely to be able to be open for support. Our research on homelessness at the moment is showing that the services out there aren't there to really support somebody going through us, uh, going through these issues because we just don't understand. Services at the moment don't understand the, the issue being a thing. You just left home, why not go back? Now, what do we do and how do we do it? And trying to form this around the organizational or occupational argument is that there's so, there's so many different ways we can look at in, incorporating the issues of apostasy in through safeguarding, through reducing threat, through reform, through legislation, through training. At the end of the day, abuse is abuse. And we need to find a way to um, inform social services or people within uh, systematic framework, frameworks that this is a thing that occurs, number one, because people don't know it exists. And number two, we then need to basically highlight how can you still highlight that abuse is going on and not be caught up in being, you know, being labeled as racist or concerning or more. At the end of the day, if it's abuse, then that's where things are. And that's a wrap. Sorry for being so quick, but that was based on the time I had. That was fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, do that if we can, if we can, <laughs> if we can have all the panelists uh, on, back on uh, with their screens online, that'd be great. Fantastic. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. We've actually got fifty-six people now. We've had a few people join. Um, I've got a number of questions here, just out of um, speed. Um, the first question was, um, Harry, is your paper paper available somewhere? Yes, it's uh, and if there's a link, if there's a link, um, if you can put that, um, if you can put that up on the Q and A box as an answer, or or send it to me, and I'll do that. That'd be great. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's go through some other questions. So, um, right. Oh, this is an interesting one. So. The first question, um, and I, I've got a bit of an answer for it, but I'll pass it over to some of you guys as well. Are Faith to Faithless and or Humanists UK campaigning against this concept of a double layer legal system? For example, Jehovah's Witnesses are subject to judicial communities, 
and countries such as Finland have challenged this concept and said they will not allow this in this in their country. I know, for example, uh, in the UK, we have sort of um, Sharia courts, which are essentially non-binding legally, but have a lot of sway within some of these communities, particularly on things like divorce and inheritance law. Now, I will put a link to work that is being done by Human UK on this, but I'd love to also get some answers from you guys in terms of, um, so the answer is basically, we are doing some work in terms of religious courts and we are obviously against it. Uh, but to kind of flip that question around, you know, what have you come across in terms of this double layer legal system? And uh, to the uh, panelists, uh, if you could answer quickly uh, rather than long answers, because we've got a few other questions. Thank you. Um, I don't have any specific wisdom to add to that, Imtiaz, just that we, we are aware of Sharia courts as well, and that's certainly something we're going to be looking into as part of barriers to accessing legal services. Yeah, likewise, but I, I think, you know, from my experience with inside the Plymouth Brethren, the rules are set almost like a legal a bind for, for the people that are participating, which is part of the oppression. And I mean, that it goes along for any high demand group. Um, and, and it's with inside that that so much of the harm can occur. And so, but how do you expose this, I think, is, is also a really relevant question. Because it's cloaked, I really liked Harry's aspect of the fact that society is also a silent enabler in many situations to this. Absolutely. Harry? I think it follows, it's, it's insular and it's really difficult to penetrate basically. Um, and there are gonna be many communities or, um, uh, you know, bubbled around that will be insular in nature that we that people just can't get within or, or highlight or raise awareness of. I think it's um, research like mine provides a, a step where we can basically say, things are going on that are hidden um, and that then provides us with a platform to then go, okay, so what else is out there? Um, so I think that's, we have a step, basically. Great. Um, so uh, there's another question here, which uh, Terry's actually kindly answered uh, in, a, in a big way, which is, uh, and maybe Harry, if you can add a little bit to this, I think you've had some experience with socials. How can I, Sue asks, how can I build friendships with others? who have also left high control organizations other than just online. I cannot find support groups locally to me. I mean, this was for, for me personally, when I left Islam, one of the big challenges, there's lots of people on Reddit, but until you meet someone physically and face-to-face, -face, it's a very, very different proposition. So obviously Humanist UK uh, have their own type of human socials. Face-to-face -face was doing, uh, like Terry's written in the, in the box, physical meetings and also, um, they have now become online, but I think we're restarting them. Harry, do you have anything to add about kind of where people meet and congregate and such? I think before, I think before a pandemic, it was people were meeting up in their locale, people were meeting for coffee, people meet, you know, it was it's a very tricky thing to organize as well. So I think Beta Bayless were doing a lot of the legwork to make sure that it was safe. Um, I mean, I used to make my own. So, you know, I remember leaving my religious faith at university. So I was like, right, I'll make a society because there are no other safeguards or support structures around. So if in doubt, make your own. If in doubt, um, contact Faith to Faithless and see if they've already got one running. Because to be fair, I think MTRs probably allude to this in that we, Faith to Faith has probably already done the legwork, so you don't have to. Um, and if they haven't done the legwork, then they can provide you with the infrastructure to do it. Um, which makes it easier for you. Um, Great. Yeah. So um, I, as a bit of an answer, um, if you email info at faithtofaithless.com, which Terry has written, or you can follow also our Facebook um, page. Uh, we're constantly putting socials and meetups on there. Just because we've got a few more questions, I'm just going to go straight there. Um, so we've got, ah, this was an interesting one, and I've got a bit of an answer for this already. So someone asked, anonymously, might it be possible for Faith to Faithless to create a central space that signposts to the research going on around apostasy and that enables apostates to participate? I had no idea all these research studies were happening. That's obviously yours, Joy, Alejandro, and uh, Harry. Um, 
but would potentially be happy to contribute my experiences. Now, just as a quick preempt that I've asked that as the question came through and uh, we thought it was a fantastic idea. So we're now investigating that. But are there already some spaces that you guys know about uh, that people can visit to start with? Obviously, I think we should be having our own. So we're hopefully working on that uh, with some consent of the authors. Any thoughts, guys? Well, the way I got involved was by contacting the volunteer coordinator, who I believe is Veronica at Faith the Faithless. So that may be uh, for first port of call, um, failing anything else. Great. Okay. Uh, Joy, this is a question for you from Neil. Coercive control by groups is a great way forward with regards to healing, dealing with those imposing controls on the apostates. Um, has this been broached with the legal authorities yet? It's an ongoing process. The results are in, in at the moment in analysis stage. The papers haven't been completed, but there is a dialogue happening between Family Survival Trust and um, MPs, but it is incredibly slow and it's almost, you know, and to get the voice heard, to get it raised is, really significant because you know there is no difference between coercive it's like harry said abuse is abuse coercive control is coercive control whether it's one-on-one -on -one or whether it's um a, a group mentality so the answer is we're working on it but we'd love more voices to make the noise louder fantastic um we've got a question here um, actually, we've got two questions here, one from Ben and one from Phil. Harry, I can see you're typing, but let's just do it in, in, in live. Um, two people, Ben and have asked, I've noticed on one of your slides, but can you please expand on what is meant by the Simba slash Scar paradox? It sounds like an interesting perspective. Um, do you want to do a quick elevator pitch yeah. into that one? It, that saves me, it saves me typing it out. So the Simba Scar paradox is basically that, spoiler alert, that part in The Lion King where Mufasa dies, Simba believes he caused it, Scar blames him, Scar shuns Simba, si Scar tells Simba to leave, shuns him, Simba leaves, Scar tells his hyenas to kill Simba, so they run after him, causes Simba to run through the, walk through the desert for a while, you know, to plod along until he finds his Timon and Pumba. So I use this example quite a lot in when we look at apostasy in going, Usually what occurs or what we know from research and from uh, uh, people's narratives is that, you know, um, things happen, people change their perspective. That's, there's a threat reaction straight away. Nine, you know, usually they're kicked out or they're usually uh, told to leave home. If you are, if you have gone through that, then contact me to get to take part in my homelessness research. When that does happen, they're usually erading the desert, desert, they're trying to find themselves, that's where we find the whole psychological breakdown, difficulties with depression, suicidality, questions, you know, philosophical questions of who am I, what am I, trying to realign one's identity, until they find the Timon and Pumbaa, so until you find someone that can share a similar experience or something that can get you out of it or move you through and find kind of peace with that, and I think that's the way that we can understand apostasy and going, well, actually, it's you're not, you're not accepted within the family home, but you find acceptance somewhere else. And you go through an identity formation change to really figure out how you can, you know, you, you recreate yourself. And Simba, throughout that film, Simba recreates himself to become more of who he wants to be to then fight Scar. But I don't advocate for violence. Great. Um, and just a comment from Sherry saying, not a question, She's from Australia. Harry, your Harry's mad and I love it. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so a question directly for Joy. Um, Anonymous, do you think it's possible to heal from the experience of being in a cult and even to grow in terms of post-traumatic growth? I act, this person says, I actually underwent EMDR as part of my recovery almost 12, 20 years ago after leaving. This is one of those two decades ago and still thinking about apostasy people. Uh, yeah, so do you think it's possible to heal and even grow? I, th I think it's possible to grow. I, I use my analogy of an amputation or of a, a serious injury. It will always be a part of a physical, if it's a physical injury, it will always be something that is, is relevant or, or a present for that being. 
Um, but I also think there's times, certainly in my own experience, when that trauma becomes re-present. So it, it re-emerges and it's therefore present again. And, and sometimes in really, you know, surprising and um, spaces that you wouldn't necessarily be aware of. And you just go, oh my God, there that is again. And so I, I, I don't think there's this complete healing, but I think there is a, a space to be able to manage and to move through it. And, you know, so yeah, but yeah that, I, that is, I, I mean, think it uh, needs a lot yeah. more research to understand it more deeply. Absolutely. Um, I can only speak anecdotally from, particularly from ex-Muslims, and you definitely see people sort of leveraging their trauma to try to do different things that they may have, it might be outside of their comfort zone, but you carry a lot of things like anxiety and, you know, just a lot of the trauma leads to certain psychological issues um, that we all face, uh, or a lot of us face. Great. Um, just bearing in mind, I have five to, we're a little bit faster than we we thought so we've got more time but just trying to give people their break um we've got still a couple of big questions so one question from naomi says we are using contacts from within high control groups to inform our training packages to professionals are there groups are other groups such as beta Vedas able to access information from the inside so to speak i was wondering how common it is to still have this access um it's not very common, I can answer that. Um, uh, Joy, is this something the Family Survival Trust does at all? What's that? My um, having have... access to inside, so basically I think what, what's being asked is they've got access to inside the cults and organizations and they're using that to train uh, services. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's the case with Fate to as far as I know. Um, obviously lived experience helps and Many of us are still, like, especially Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of XJWs are still connected to people who are um, inside, but not inside. And so that helps them understand where things are going. But I don't think we've ever used that within a professional setting. Um, yeah, that's very interesting, Naomi. We'd probably be keen to hear more about that. Right. Um, I think this is a question for Alejandro and, uh, and then maybe Harry. I'm training as a psychotherapist and want to specialize in helping those who want to or have left a cult, uh, do Fate to Fatus help guide people to professionals or would you create the space if it's not already there? Uh, whichever one of you want to take this first. I'm certainly aware that Fate to Fatus provide apostasy safeguarding training. I think there was a session last month. So that's certainly something you can get involved with. I don't know if there are any other services that we as an organization can provide. In relation to psychotherapy, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated. I think Dr. Jilly Jenkinson will be talking about her work, I think. So probably want to hold up until then. Um, or I could probably argue from a base, I mean, it's my bread and butter in that it's a bit like dual citizenship when it comes to apostasy. So you've got the citizenship from the identity formation you were in, you've got the citizenship in the identity formation you've now created. Um, for, you know, some people do a lot of work to try and forget that or move away from it or work through it. And it's, that's, that's their prerogative, but it doesn't leave. Um, so it'll always have a, you know, that's, that, that's your founding block so it'll always have a part of that so that's why I call it a dual citizenship so yeah um we can't eradicate what's what you've learned and how you developed and all that kind of, I mean that would just be like redoing attachment and it's that's complicated um but Great. it's how we work with that and just to add to that um we already have peer support groups for um for fate to fatalist members. So I've joined a few of them myself. They're fantastic. They're not actually therapy. We're not allowed to call them therapy, but essentially they're facilitated conversations uh, in a group setting. And they are just incredible. I've been to a couple. Um, I'm gonna say this because it's been told that I'm allowed to say it. We're actually um, putting together a helpline as well. That's gonna be starting a pilot next year. It will be one of the first apostasy helplines that as far as I know exist. Uh, particularly definitely in the UK, as far as I know. Um, so that's very exciting, I think. Great. Uh, we've got another just question that's come in. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to 
try to quickly just say this is more like a comment and then there's one question and then if there's no more questions we're going to end a little bit early just so that you guys have a bit longer than 10 minutes for a break so um jill said we really do this is in response to what we were talking earlier about research coordination and where there's a signposting we really do need some coordination those who are in the round tables will have heard jill mention the research at the university of south Salford that's being planned planned it's going to be huge and cover many of the questions but she does not have a lot of understanding of what's happening elsewhere so research forming would be great and um uh, we would have more power. I completely agree with that. So I think Creative Gates is going to take this quite seriously. Thank you for bringing this up. Uh, and clearly, Joy, from what you were saying earlier, uh, and Alejandro, like that's very much needed. Uh, there's not really a lot of coordination, is there? Great. Great. So I'll do the, uh, I'll put the last question up. Oh, okay. There's another question that come in. I'll do this. Uh, and then I'll finish off with the last question because it's a nice segue. Specific to therapy, I've heard of many uh, individuals uh, that are looking for therapists trained in RTS. Especially, equally, my therapist, I educated a great deal and is interested in helping ex-cult members. How can faith to faithless join the two specific to therapy? I've heard of many individuals that are looking for therapists trained in RTS. Um, I'm going to guess uh, we are putting together sort of signposting. Uh, I, I know, for, for example, we have signposted apostates before to therapists, but I don't think we have anything official like that at the moment. Joy, do you guys have a sort of list of therapists with RTS type qualifications? No, it is, it's on our to-do list. We, we think it would be list. really useful to have that kind of resource available to people who have Fantastic. Like Fantastic. It's very clear there's so much work to be done, huh? Okay. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to end it. Unfortunately, there's a few other questions. Maybe we'll try to answer them in the chat. Um, but thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, there is, uh, there is, like I said, a a, a a a panel at the end, which is to do with the future of research, and I think that'll be a very interesting segue from this. Um, if you guys have any more uh, thoughts on areas we should focus on, not just at Future Papers, but also within this group, please write them down in the box so we can take note. Um, there's going to be a short break now. It's going to be about 14 minutes long. Uh, uh, so we'll be back 30 past. Um, we are, this is free. This conference was free and it's basically been paid for by Faith to Fayless and our supporters. Um, if you did want to support us, there's a donate button that's going to be posted in the chat. Um, feel free to donate. donate. Uh, thank you, Alejandro, Joy and Harry for joining this session it was really interesting for me personally and I'm so excited to see that you know maybe some things can come out of the, just the chat that we've just had like people were asking questions and I've been sending them through to Humanist UK and Fate to Fate they've been going oh, that's a great idea we should do that so uh, who knows how much of that will be done because things that are hard to do but uh, very excited to see if we can get this uh, this ball rolling in terms of research coordination thank you very much for joining hello and welcome back <laughs> Um, this session that we're about to start now is to um, talk about, um, well, really just to tell the stories of apostates. Um, so we've got the second plenary. Um, I'll just give a minute for um, our two speakers to rejoin us. Um, and I'd, Emily, are you there? Do you want to put your video on? And then if, um, yeah, you are good. Thank you. Okay, so I will start. Um, yes, yeah, so now um, what we're going to do is just to, uh, talk about um, the stories of apostates. So you're going to hear three stories, one from a former Jehovah's Witness, that's me, um, one from a former Muslim, which is Jimmy, and one from a former um, ultra-Orthodox um, Jew, which is Emily. Okay, so um, yeah, and then after we've told, we'll sort of tell our stories in in uh, in turn, and then we'll have a little discussion between the three of us, and then I'll open it up to question and answers. Um, you can use the Q and A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You'll see a Q and A button. Um, so if you want to ask any of the questions, just type your question in there. Uh, feel free to type those at any time, and then we'll answer those um, at the end of this session. Um, and this session should go on till about half, half past three. Okay, 
So I will start off by telling my story. Um, as I say, I, um, I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. What happened was uh, my mother converted to the Jehovah's Witness when I was uh, about seven years old, along with my grandmother. Uh, she had recently left my violent father, so was already in a vulnerable situation. The Jehovah's Witnesses were kind and they were an instant um, a group of friends who helped us move house, they helped us decorate, they took us on holidays with them, and we were instantly accepted when my mother had no one at that time. Uh, six months after her being baptised, she married what's called a ministerial servant, a man in the congregation with some sort of minor responsibilities. Um, this man instantly began to terrorise us with scripture. Uh, he would read stories of Armageddon and um, explicit stories of birds pecking out our eyes from the book of Ezekiel to punish us for regular childish, child, childlike behaviours. Um, and I also began weekly Bible studies at that time with him, for, as I say, from the age of seven. And these could last up to three hours long. I would ask questions as many of the stories um, made little sense to me at that time. And some seemed quite immoral, like um, the death of children, uh, murder of children by God and such forth. I'd be smacked um, for asking those questions um, and for questioning Jehovah. And I was often told off for that, too. Uh, these Bible stories all often ended up with me um, in tears. Eventually, I did learn to stop asking questions, but it took some time. Um, and by about the age of 12, I believe that my real personality had been completely suppressed. Um, I would say um, that the JW life experience is about two things, fear and isolation. Uh, the literature that they produce is covered in images of death, even for children. They have a yellow book called My Book of Bible Stories. Almost every page has somebody dying on it. Um, there's a strong uh, pressure to isolate yourself from non-Jehovah's Witnesses, including family members, and also to isolate yourself from other Jehovah's Witnesses who are seen as spiritually weak. You're strongly encouraged to spy on your brothers and sisters and, um, and male elders are instructed to tell you how you ought to live your life uh, and sometimes to the quite minute detail. At about age 13, I got baptised. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't have um, baby baptisms, but they still have childhood baptisms. And about age 18, I became what's known as a regular pioneer, which is where I'd spent about 90 hours a month in um, unpaid door knocking. You'll have seen, seen the Jehovah's Witnesses knocking your doors. Um, um, as this was going on, my oldest sister had been kicked out of home and sent to my grandma's as it was believed she was possessed by demons. And the evidence for her being possessed by demons was she listened to an Iron Maiden album. Um, my next oldest sister was disfellowshipped at the age of 18, which is excommunicated. This was just for the sin of falling in love with a man who'd been married before. Um, he was separated um, and had been for some time, but he was not what they would uh, say was scripturally divorced. So within the confines of what they would allow for divorce. That meant for five years we couldn't speak to my sister. She'd sit, there were three meetings a week at the Kingdom Hall, the name for they give for the church. She'd sit at the back of that Kingdom Hall, each of those meetings, and we weren't allowed to even turn around and look at her. We were told um, it, we could be like Lot's wife who turned around because of her lack of faith and was turned into a pillar of salt. So we weren't allowed to look at our sister even. My younger sister at the age of 15 had expressed doubts and wanted to become an actress and, and um, she stopped attending meetings. This was very hard for her and it created um, um, a separation in, in the family for all of us as well. Um, and for, so for a while, I was the only one still in the religion. At about age 20, I began having doubts. I stayed out late with other Jehovah's Witness friends one night. And my, the next day, my mother said I had no respect and ordered me out of the house with just a bin liner of clothes. Uh, my younger sister was also kicked out at the same time, uh, just as she was supposed to be starting university. 
um, I couch surfed for a while. So I was actually homeless. It took me some years to realize I was homeless because I wasn't sleeping rough, but I was uh, just staying at other people's homes um, and flitting between them and staying with friends that people that I barely knew um, and then moved um, in with my cousins who I hadn't seen in years. Um, so it was quite an unsettled life for quite some years. After that, about, after a few years, I settled into a, a more relatively normal life and I began to reach out online to other ex Jehovah's Witnesses and I'd found an online community of friends. Most of these, however, were in the USA and there were very few in the UK at that time that I could access anyway. So in 2007, I set up what is now called XJW Friends UK. Um, we arrange social events for ex Jehovah's Witnesses and, and for others. And we do uh, theatre trips and uh, museum tours and things like that. And I now run that with um, my friend, uh, Steve Richardson. Um, and since the pandemic, obviously, we've not been able to have these in-person events. So we've moved these events to online, onto Zoom. Uh, we've got over a thousand members in the UK. And today, I'm glad to say the Extra Jehovah's Witness community internationally and nationally in the UK has a very strong and very supportive base um, online, um, which offers peer support. So if you're a former Jehovah's Witness and you don't know about um, these communities, do let me know and I can introduce you. Um, and then more recently, five years ago, I joined uh, Faith to Faithless um, at its inception. And today I am uh, the chair of Faith to Faithless. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that we've, we've been doing to offer to um, apostates and, and what we're building um, um, for the future uh, people who are leaving these high control religious groups. Um, and then today I live quite a happy, settled life with my partner in the Midlands. And uh, we're due to have our first child next month. So life has certainly improved and just goes to show in answer to someone's question. Yes, life does get better after even a, a, a horrific time like that. Um, so, yes, that's my story in a nutshell. Um, so what I want to do is introduce um, Jimmy. Jimmy but, um, is an ex-Muslim. And today he works as a psychotherapist specializing in working with other ex-Muslims and, and other apostates, actually, in an international context. He's a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, and he works with organizations such as ourselves at Faith to Faithless and uh, Secular Rescue, bringing awareness to the plight of apostates in Islamic communities. So, Jimmy, can I hand over to you? Yeah, so I guess a bit about the story. Uh, I'll try and be as succinct as you, Terry. Uh, and uh, although it might not be as well punctuated with ages and uh, years and dates and such. So I was born in the UK, in London, and I was born to, into a Muslim family, a Pakistani Muslim family. Uh, it was conservative, but not super conservative. And I think one of the ways you can deduce how conservative uh, a Muslim family is, and perhaps this goes across all Abrahamic faiths, is by looking at how the women are dressed in that family. So in uh, my family, my sisters didn't have to wear a headscarf, a hijab or a niqab or anything like that. And actually back then, when I was growing up, there's all quite rare things to see in London. Um, and my mum would wear traditional Pakistani clothing. So she'd wear like a shawa kameez and then she'd wear what is called a dupatta. So almost like a light scarf over her head. Um, which would still have hair showing, and it wasn't the kind of really sort of conservative hijab that we see now that doesn't show any hair whatsoever. So it was just very traditional Pakistani clothing. Um, we, we, like many diaspora communities, we uh, all lived near each other. So there was a whole community of Pakistani um, Muslims who lived near each other. And so that kind of gave you a sense of almost like a, a mini Pakistan that you were in with all of the rules and social traditions that Pakistan would hold itself. But because we were in London and we went to school, we were also exposed as children to many other uh, cultures and, uh, and people. And I think that perhaps if that wasn't the case, maybe my questioning wouldn't have started so um, emphatically. 
one of the things, and there were two main things that, that growing up in a Muslim family that kind of stuck out to me uh, and really started uh, my route to questioning. At a very young age, I was just so aware at how differently my mum and my two sisters were treated compared to me, my four brothers, and my dad. And that would manifest in a, a, daily, a daily way, down to you know, who would wash the dishes, who would wash the clothing, um, where people were allowed to go, how people would, would dress when they would go outside, what sort of details my sisters were expected to provide if they were going to leave the house, like where they were going, who they were going with, what time they would be back, um, compared to what my brothers and I were expected to provide. It was a lot less of an interrogation if we were leaving the house. Uh, and that didn't matter whether my sisters, who were two of the eldest children in the family, uh, so the age disparity didn't seem to make sense because if an older brother went out, he would get questioned a lot less than someone like myself who was the youngest. But my sisters, who were the two next children from the eldest, would get interrogated about where they were going, what they were doing, who they were going to be with, in the same way that a youngest child would get interrogated. I think with hindsight now, you know, I think that whole um, interrogation, the, the need to control what they were wearing, making sure that everything was covered up, all of that policing around them is really, when it comes down to it, an effort to police their virginity. That's all that it's about. It's ensuring that these girls stay out of any sort of boyfriend type relationship uh, and ensuring that they stay virgins so that they don't dishonor the family uh, and so that they're available to be married. Um, in addition to that, I grew up around a lot of domestic violence. Uh, so my dad would be quite violent towards my mother. There was a lot of violence towards the children in the house. And there was one point where I just didn't understand because I fully accepted that Islam was true. There was no two ways about that. This was the, the true religion. Christians and Jews, you know, they had it for a while, but then they messed it all up. So God sent um, the real truth all over again to Muslims in this book that would never change. And we had that truth. Hindus and Buddhists, what the hell were they thinking? They weren't even real religions. They were completely lost. Um, and they were just seen as a superstition, if anything. Um, so because of the violence, I remember saying to my dad one day when I was very young, like, why are you being mum? It's not Muslim to be your wife. It's not Muslim to be our mum. And then my dad saying to me, no, God has said that I can hit my wife. And I just thought that that was ludicrous and he must be wrong. Uh, and then subsequent, you know, there's a verse, uh, verse 4 through 4, which is quite infamous these days, which makes it really clear that actually her husband has got three steps. And on the third steps for his disobedient wife, hitting her is an option, if not mandated. You know, it's kind of an instruction guide. Like, first of all, stop speaking to her. If she's still disobedient, then stop sleeping with her. And if she maintains that disobedience, then hit her. And I think we try and, uh, Muslims in the 21st century, try and reinterpret that in all kinds of wonderful ways, like hit her with a handkerchief or beat her with a toothbrush. But really, it just says hit her. Um, so that was really something that uh, caused a lot of cognitive dissonance. And then subsequent to that, and I'm going to try and speed through this bit because I'm mindful of time, was as, as somebody who's growing up into their sexuality as a gay man, Whenever I tried to find out what my religion was saying about homosexuality, whether it was the mosque or whether it was family members or extended family members, um, it was always the same thing. It was, uh, if you're, you can't be gay and Muslim, if you are gay, the Sharia compliant punishment for a gay person is execution. And then there was a lovely extensive debate about what was the best way to kill your gay. Like some people think it should be hanging, other people think it should be stoning to death, some other people think it should be decapitation. Um, and so really coming to this point in life where I began to fundamentally believe that actually I should be executed and that that was the right thing to happen to me, but because I wasn't acting on my sexuality, I hadn't officially committed that sin yet. Um, 
fast forward at some point, I did start acting on my sexuality and my family found out that I was gay and I was disowned and kicked out of the house at about 23. And um, I think disowning someone or shunning them, ostracism, is a coercive mechanism. You know, the idea is we'll kick you out, you'll conform, and then you'll come back to the religion because you're failing so badly. But when you do that in the UK, there's a whole other secular civil society there to hopefully catch you. And from that vantage point, you're able to critically assess what it is that you've been born into. So rather than me failing and falling and going back to the the family reconverting, what I did was I was able to step away and just assess everything I was taught uh, and look into it a bit more. At that point, I started hearing voices like Maryam Namazi, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who were people who were just criticizing Islam and saying all of the things that I thought for so many years, but I'd never said out loud. Uh, so I became far more comfortable identifying as an ex-Muslim. Uh, I then started doing activism work, I became a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, started doing some work with Faith to Faithers, uh, qualified as a psychotherapist and uh, worked with Yasmin Mohammed to set up Free Hearts, Free Minds, where we offered international support to um, ex-Muslims in Muslim majority countries in terms of psychotherapeutic work. Uh, and so that's where I am today. And yes, it gets so much better. Like life is amazing now, it's simply amazing. Oh, thank you for that, Jimmy. And I, and, I, and I like that you said that as well, that it gets better. I, I was sort of, I got that phrase from, um, there was a big YouTube um, um, event called It Gets Better for um, LGBT people coming out. And it was to help LGBT people who were still in the closet um, by telling their story of, you know, how bad it was at one point and, that, and then where they are today and in a happier place to help those who are feeling quite desperate or perhaps even as, as, as bad as feeling suicidal. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the thing, your highlight there at, at the end, it does, it does get better. And you can, there might be people in the audience today who, who feel they're a part, a part in their life who, where it's, it's, that looks like a distant dream, but it, it, mm. it does get better. It does. Thank you so much for telling us your story. Um, what I want to do is now bring on um, Emily Green um to tell her story emily um were, uh, grew up in stamford hill in london in the ultra orthodox uh, bells hasidic community um she later went on to found uh, gesha eu which is now a registered uk charity they support others who have also left ultra orthodox communities in the uk and in europe um, this helps others who make the choice of leaving and um, they would need assistance and support in integrating into mainstream society and and for that for that community this is very much needed and it's really wonderful that 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 people like emily Emily and others are providing these kind of services. Um, Emily, would you like to tell us your story? Can I hand over to you? <laughs> Hi, yes. Thank you, Terry, for that. Um, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for um, being here and listening to our stories. Uh, I'm going to try and get it in um, in the short amount of time that I have. Um, and it's always hard to know what to include, um, but I'm going to try and, you know, Give you at least some of the key points um, and hopefully understand a little bit about where I grew up, um, what prompted me to leave and um, yeah a little bit about that journey, what that journey looked like. Um, so yeah as Terry said I grew up in Stamford Hill in North London. Um, I almost think of myself having grown up um, in Stamford Hill rather than London um, and I think I realised that later on when I left. Um, and the reason for that is because um, Stanford Hill and the community I grew up was so cut off, so closed off from the outside world. So, you know, we are living in the 21st century, um, but, you know, I had very little awareness or knowledge of what was going on um, outside of Stanford Hill, really. And even within the non-Jewish elements of Stanford Hill. Um, so, you know, in, in the Hasidic community, it's very self-contained. So I wouldn't have gone to a regular public school. We have our own, they, the community have their own private schools. 
um, where, you know, those are the schools that we had to attend. As a woman, ironically, um, as a child growing up, we were more privileged than boys because we were allowed to get some sort of a secular education for half of our school day, unlike the boys who received very minimal education. Um, so that's quite ironic. And the reason for that is it's quite, it's supposed to be oppressive because the reasoning is that boys um, in this patriarchal community are the ones who are allowed to learn more of the Bible. And of course, the women who are going to just get married and raise children don't need to have all that knowledge. Um, but clearly we you know, need to be in school. So we're gonna teach you something. So I was allowed to do GCSEs for which I am really grateful for because that really was sort of my exit route eventually, um, which I'll get to in a couple of minutes. Um, but, you know, growing up, um, I definitely believed in the religion, uh, like Jimmy and Terry were saying, you know, you, you don't really, I, I didn't really anyway question much of it. Um, it was very much about doing the right thing, wanting to please everyone. Um, and I think this sort of carried on um, until I was sort of an older teenager. Um, so I always knew that I was going to get married young, like all the other people in the community. And I was sort of in the back of my mind ready for that. Um, I think the first bit that kind of like made me question a little bit was when I was ex when I started my teaching career. Well, I wouldn't even call it a career. It's like girls in the community because they get married so young. Uh, as soon as you leave school or seminary, like the sixth form in the community, um, you would sort of get a job you wouldn't be qualified in. And it's sort of almost just waiting to, you know, while your parents are finding you the suitable man to marry. Um, so I started teaching, um, obviously earned less than minimum pay, um, but realized that actually I quite, I'm quite good at it. I quite enjoy it. And I wanted to qualify and you make this into a career. Um, and my parents stepped in and tried to stop me. So that was kind of the first big sort of personal experience of me wanting something and um, my parents and, they, you know, saying, oh, the community. And the big reason was, well, you know, that won't help you find a suitable match. Um, they wanted to make sure that I was the oldest of their family. Um, they were going to find a really wonderful boy. And that would be somebody who was a true devout Hasidic Jew who would marry me. And obviously I would have lots of children. And that was the aspiration. But for me, it felt like I couldn't accept that that was just going to be my whole life. Don't get me wrong. I, I did want to have lots of children, like all my aunts. And when I mean lots of children, we're talking about large families, like 10 children plus. Um, I was definitely, you know, I'd been brainwashed and sort of, you know, growing up in that sort of mindset. But I also loved learning and I wanted a career. Um, but ultimately, I knew I was going to get married, um, which is exactly what happened. Um, and at the age of 20, I was introduced to my husband then. Um, and as is normal in that community, um, I met my husband on a Sunday night. Within 24 hours, I was engaged to be married. Um, I didn't even question it. I didn't even think that there was anything strange, except that I felt worried. And I did tell my father, I'm sure he's a wonderful boy. My father would have interviewed the boy before I met him because they would have done all their checks. And, you know, the meeting of the, the girl and the boy in that community is literally a formality. Um, but my father's response was, well, everybody does it. You'll be fine. Um, however, I, I, I was really nervous about it. I couldn't even express what I was nervous about or why. Um, we, I think we only spoke twice on the phone in, during my six month engagement. Um, but six months later, we got married. And I remember the night of the wedding, um, feeling really anxious, again, not knowing why. Um, as the wedding sort of came towards an end, I was feeling really, um, started shaking visibly. Um, people asked me if I was okay and I actually didn't even know what was going on. Um, looking back now, the reason was because I was going to be raped that night. It was simple as that, but there were no words for that. And there was nobody who explained it in that way. It was just everybody. And I remember saying, well, everybody does it. But the reality is that, you know, here you are at the night of your wedding um, with a man that you've met two or three times or barely knew. Um, and we were told that unless you have sex that night of the wedding, your wedding is not considered um, kosher. It's not, you know, it's not valid. So you're kind of forced into that situation. Um, and obviously now, today, 
I realized these are all mechanisms, control, um, you know, the girls and boys are very young um, and it's very well designed to ensure that you are well and truly trapped, um, which is exactly what happened because um, six weeks after the wedding, I got pregnant. Um, women are not allowed to go on birth control without asking the rabbi. I remember after having three children under the age of three, I did want to have children. Remember, I was, you know, trying to do the right thing, but I was exhausted. Um, I was, you know, I was coping, but just about, and I just couldn't face, you know, clearly I was, you know, going to just keep getting pregnant. So then I realized that, but I had to call the rabbi and ask his permission. And I remember he said, well, you know, we can't expect you to have children if you really, really can't cope. You know, are you ill? Are you sick? And I was thinking, well, I'm not sick now, but I will probably be losing my mind if I do get pregnant within the next few months. Um, and it was like, well, I'll give you three months and call me back in three months time. Um, and then I think I did this once more. And by that point, I just thought, well, I'm probably going to end up having more children anyway. So get pregnant again. Um, but during all this time, my marriage didn't improve. And what was worse was I was expected to continuously have sex with my husband. Um, it's all very regulated within the community. Um, I'm not going to go into that because that's a whole, um, you know, set of laws. But the expectation was, you know, we are a married couple. My husband expected it of me. But to me, looking back, um, that was something that never left me. You know, I talked about the raping of that first night, but it didn't end there. For me, it was like, you know, a continuous trauma. And again, I couldn't talk to anyone about it. Um, on the outside, my life looked perfect. I was having children. Uh, my husband at the time was a devout, you know, respected member of the community. Um, I, at the same time, pursued my career through online learning and then got my PGSC, PGCS, PGCE, um, which I was very grateful. So I was kind of trying to make the best of it, but really deeply unhappy. Um, I think it was as I kind of moved through my 20s and that constant feeling of, you know, this life is all happening, but I don't have a choice in it. Um, but even more belief beneath that, there was a sense of looking at my children and thinking these things that I'm unhappy about and started to sort of be more aware about what had happened in terms of, you know, getting married, being forced into this marriage. Um, the internet started to kind of become more of a the, you know more known and um I, I did gain access i always had to hide it from my husband but i did make it my business i was curious to find out more about the outside world and he started realizing that you know there are other ways of living i still didn't think there was a way of leaving i knew if i did leave uh, my parents would not support me they would support my ex-husband um they thought they worshipped him they thought he was amazing um and i knew that all contacts in my community, my friends, anyone I knew um, would probably ostracize me. Um, so it was something which I couldn't even face or think about. But I think it just kind of never really left me. And there was a sense, growing sense of my children growing older and thinking about the future. Uh, my son, who was seven or eight years old at the time. Um, and as I mentioned previously, uh, boys in the Hasidic community don't get much of a secular education. They learn, I would say, up to a year two, maybe year three level, and then their secular education stops entirely. This is not the case for all Hasid, for all um, boys in the Haredi community, but certainly mostly in the Hasidic community. Um, so as a teacher, it just felt really wrong that this was happening to my son. Um, and then I thought about my daughters and about what would be happening to them. They would be married off at a young age and perhaps would feel the same way and how would I live with myself if I would put them through what I was you know going through so at the age of 30 in 2010 um, I made a very big decision to separate from my husband I knew this was going to be very difficult it was uh, my parents um, you know came out against me um, instantly overnight I, I became the subject of rumors um, I uh, was told I had to leave my job um, I was cut off from all sources of support. Uh, my parents made it very clear that they would not be supporting me. I was on my own. Um, and what started was a two year custody battle over my children. Um, the community came out in full support of my ex-husband. Uh, they gave him full financial legal support. Um, and um, I was in court for two years, um, literally feeling like my children don't belong to me. Um, the rabbis, community members, anyone, you know, people that 
would babysit my children or friends, neighbors, all writing letters in support of my ex-husband to say um, what a wonderful father he is. And uh, the rabbis were, well, you know, I could leave and make choices, but of course the children, um, since I agreed to have the children and raise them within the community, uh, they would obviously have to stay there um, and leave them to my ex-husband to raise. Um, now, remember, he's a man growing up in a society where men are not expected to do much at home. So he had little idea about how to parent or do anything or much around the house. So that thought was horrifying to me as a mother. Um, but yeah, what, what became apparent to me was even more about how evil this community felt, how they were treating me. Um, you know, when you're living in the community and sort of following all the laws, it kind of, you know, you question, but when I saw kind of going along that journey of trying to leave and getting a divorce and the custody, it just made me suddenly really realize what the community is about and the control that um, they exert over um, its members. Um, but fast forward two years, uh, thank God, you know, we live in a secular country and um, the judge did, you know, I was, things were, you know, went in my favor. Um, I requested my children to be moved to um, non Haredi schools, uh, so mainstream schools, um, and, um, you know, they, they could get that education and experiences and opportunities and choices, most of, Lee, most of all, sorry, that, um, that I didn't have. Um, and um, I think one of the big things, um, going back to what Terry and Jimmy are sort of in terms of support for people that leave the community, um, I set up Geshe EU. Um, this was inspired by a trip to New York where I saw an organization called Footsteps. And um, that moment when I walked into a room of people who just understood and uh, supportive, because um, it felt like such a lonely journey. And I, I remember thinking like, am I the only crazy one that's questioning this? Um, you know, all I knew were the people that were lived in the community. And I felt like, you know, I've got loads of cousins, we're all big families, you know, is there something wrong with me? And of course they say, you know, you are mad. Um, so that feeling of like there's others like me also questions and seeing that they managed to leave and live you no know, normal lives was so inspiring to me, um, which led me to believe there have to be people here in the UK. Um, and I kind of made that sort of promise that when things are, you know, improved for me and I'm settled, um, I'm going to do something to make sure that if anybody else makes that decision, there is going to be support. Um, and yeah, you know, fast forward, you know, eight, nine years uh, down the line, I'm, I'm pleased to say um, Geshe U exists. We, um, you know, communicate with other organizations, you know, like Terry's and um, Faith to Faithless. Um, so, you know, we know that people who do make that decision, they are not doing it on their own. They are getting that support. Um, I still worry because we all, I, I, my, this is my, you know, where social control is so strong. Despite all the support in place, not enough people leave. We have so many people calling where they want to leave, they don't believe in the religion, but they're too afraid. And the biggest problems are, you know, oh, I can't lose that relationship with my parents, my, what's going to happen to my children, all the people that you know that your whole life, um, you know, suddenly overnight. And, and that's something that as much as support there is, that's such a difficult thing to do. Um, and, and I understand it, I do. Um, and, and when I left, actually, one of the things I actually came out with was, I now know why people don't just leave. Um, so that's something I think we still grapple with, struggle with, um, and thinking about how that can change because the community is still, um, you know, it's still in existence, um, but, you know, clearly those problems are still there. Um, but, um, I don't want to go on for too much longer, but, you know, similar to what Je uh, Jimmy and Terry were saying, it definitely gets better. My own children are going off to university. Uh, my daughter's 20, the age when I got married and got pregnant already. Um, and it horrifies me to think that, she, you know, what I was doing at that age, um, to me, it just seems she's so young. Um, I didn't think I was that young. To me, it was normal. Um, so, you know, that's a, a big relief. Um, but, um, you know, like, like I say, you know, it definitely does get better. Um, things, you know, do get, imp do, do improve. However, like I said, you know, I think there's still a lot that we can do, um, to try and make this journey easier and try to tackle some of these issues that are still ongoing. 
Um, but to leave on a positive note, um, I have recently reconnected with my parents um, and that's been positive. Um, I feel like that threat over my children is removed. They're now old enough. Um, and I think there's a certain degree of acceptance. So, you know, definitely um, things, things have definitely got better. Um, and I think that, you know, if you, you are brave enough to make that journey, there's definitely a possibility and it is possible to leave and to have the life that you want. So I think that that's really a positive. Anyway, um, thank you for listening. Um, there's, I think, going to be some questions. Um, I'm going to pass over to Terry. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. That was really um, good to hear your story. Um, I have heard your story uh, briefly before, but not in, in such detail. Um, I think there's going to be quite a few people in the audience who perhaps don't know. They pro they're, they're, they'll have heard about the plight of ex-Muslims um, online or in the news. Um, but I, I, I think the, the stories of ex um, ultra Orthodox Jewish people is really something that we need to be hearing more of. Um, I, we, we, we know about the communities through culture, but we just don't really, I think a lot of it, certainly for me anyway, when I first heard um, um, ex Hasidic stories, I was very shocked to hear how just how controlling and cult like those um, those groups are. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us today. It was, it was really good to hear. Um, yeah, so what I want to do now is if we we'll just have a little discussion amongst ourselves um, and then we'll bring it out to question and answer from the audience. While we're talking, if the audience, if you want to write questions that you're interested, either directed to all of us or, or an individual one, doesn't matter. Um, just write in the, as I say, at the bottom, it says Q&A on your Zoom. Um, just type your question in there and then we'll come to that at, at, at the end. Um, yeah, so uh, I first wanted to sort of ask a question about identity, really. Um, I think the reason I wanted to talk about identity is because of all the researchers that contact us are often researching the concept of identity. And perhaps in ordinary life, it's not something that we might think about too much. But clearly for apostates, it's a huge issue. Um, and I've, I he I've heard, I was just sort of trying to take notes while the two of you were speaking of how you identified yourself when you were in your religious community and Jimmy I was sort of hearing um, a lot of uh, comments that suggested quite a bit of self-hate because you were accepting the judgments made about homosexuality etc um, and that you even to the point where you believed that it was right that you should be executed, which is a, a horrific thought for, for anybody who, uh, uh, it's probably difficult to understand for anyone who's not been raised in such a community. So I just wanted to ask each of you, um, uh, how you s sort of see how your identity just changed from being this submissive follower of your faith to uh, who you were when you first left and then to who you were, who you are today, really. Um, do you recognise yourself at all when you look back at who you were, Jimmy? Um, yeah, I'm actually astonished at how far I come. And I, I, I make it a deliberate practice to stop and acknowledge that. I think you know, in the throes of our busy lives, sometimes we don't take time to acknowledge our growth and our successes. And so it is a very much a deliberate practice for me to just kind of walk the path of everything I've been through uh, uh, and everything I've achieved. So I think there's two things that stand out for me. So um, one of them is ties exactly into what you're saying is this concept of, of self-loathing and shame, yeah? And definitely that was such a part of my identity. It's unbelievable looking back. Like now as, as an out proud gay man who helps other people come to terms with their sexuality, looking at, you know, this dirty secret that I had that if it was ever found out was going to cause me to lose my family and lose my community and having to continually hide that. Uh, 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 initially hiding it from myself and then when accepting that this is who you know this was the reality that I am attracted to other men having to then hide that uh, from the community at large as well and, and I think sometimes 
like when I was thrown out at about 23, I was like, right, I'm out loud and proud now, you know, I can be who I really am. But the nuances of ostracism and, and the mechanisms that are so brutal, you know, this just severing of all connection to the people who are meant to be your nearest and dearest um, is so severe that something about it becomes internalized. So, you know, for many years I was working through and in, in, in my own therapy myself, was working through this, this younger part of me that felt it was so hideous and so abhorrent, so fundamentally flawed that even the people who were supposed to be obligated to love me, which were my brothers and sisters and my parents, even those people couldn't love me because I was so fundamentally uh, toxic or corrupted or broken. You know, and that took a very long time to unwind uh, uh, and heal from. So that concept of shame kind of was, was a core part of my identity. And then I think, you know, maybe, maybe in some ways opposite to that is just this idea of love. If I've got time, Terry, or do you need me to? You're on mute, you're on mute. It's my favorite thing about Zoom. You're on mute, Terry. <laughs> oh dear, sorry. You'd think I'd know by now. Um, Jimmy, yeah, I know you wanted to ask a quick question about love. So do, let's, let's move through this bit a bit quicker, but, um, but yeah, do ask your question. I know it was not really a question. It's just oh. a, the concept of love. I was reflecting on that before, uh, and I often do anyway. So it's just this idea that how twisted my perception of love was, was. And, and you know that also forms a core part of your identity, which is this idea that there's this supreme being in the sky who was your fundamental creator and your fundamental provider, like anything good that comes into your life is given by this supreme being. And he has this rule, which is you must obey me and be obedient. And actually, if you're not, uh, and he loves you unconditionally, of course, right? That's why, you know, God loves you. That's why he made us. Uh, and he wants us to get to heaven. But if you don't comply, if you are not obedient, well, then what he's going to do is he's going to torture you in hell mm -hmm. for all eternity. And much like um, the JWs, our descriptions of hell are very colorful. Like it's all colored in for you. There's no need to use your imagination. He will pour boiling, boiling hot pus down your throat until your stomach explodes. He'll feed you nettled food that will get caught in your throat and have you gasping for water and the water will be boiling, your skin will be flailed from you, and then it'll be put right back on and flailed again. Like just this endless repetition of torture that this creature who loves you unconditionally is gonna do to you if you don't obey. And then below him is like your mum and dad, your parents, who are in some ways your creator and who are definitely your provider, who also love you. But if you disobey them, then you can also expect violence and shunning and ostracism, condemnation, shouting, swearing, the whole works. But within the framework, if this divine being who loves you is going to act that way, well, then it makes perfect sense that a husband who's above his wife would beat his wife, because that is how the supreme being is going to enact his love and, um, on you and also his uh, disgruntlement. He will also enact it in that way. Yeah. So somehow you then internalize this vision of love or this meaning of love, which is if you're not obedient, violence is an acceptable way for you to yeah. be dealt with. And, it and takes a long manipulation, time to completely. Manipulation, yeah. emotional blackmail, because you know the Quran is pages and hadiths are pages of emotional blackmail within them. Um, so it took a long time for me to kind of be like, oh my God, this is not, actually what love is there's nothing healthy about that okay yeah yeah no it's not it's not and it, uh, um, it's so in, um, ingrained in us this conditional love that's full of violence and isolation etc as you pointed out um uh, yeah sorry just a, no, more comments coming through so there's quite a few questions coming through um i know uh, sorry emily i was going to see is your question a, a a a quick one because i just i want to leave enough time for the audience questions 
Yeah, no, it's not it's not that important. If you want to devote this time to, um, you know, I mean, I'll just make a quick comment if that's yeah, okay do. about what Jimmy was saying. Um, I think one of the things that, based on the idea of identity, um, you know, they sort of raise you with kind of things that you, sh you know, a particular identity. And me as a woman in the community, um, it was like, me being kind of an obedient good girl it was like something I wanted to buy into you're told you know similar to what you're saying about going to heaven and being a good virtuous woman means being submissive being obedient doing all those things um which I kind of you buy into and you're like you know I was particularly the type of child I wasn't rebellious or anything like that on the contrary I was the opposite wanting to please but then when it comes to like you know feeling really miserable or not liking certain things or in your own kind of ideas and your individual identity starts to develop and it starts to clash with what the community wants of you. And it causes such anguish, such conflict. Um, now, obviously I made the choice to kind of embrace my own identity, but like Jimmy was saying, I think taking years to undo this idea of being submissive and being obedient is something that has really stayed with me without realizing. And I think for me to acknowledge that later on, yeah, through therapy and just realizing um, those beliefs and the way I kind of interact with the world, is there and to undo that and to change that takes a lot, a lot of work, a lot of awareness. So um, those long-term impacts, I think that's something I didn't really consider enough or think about. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, it's big, that is. I ju just uh, my own point on that, it was that um, just looking back at who I was when I was a witness, I really consider that I was quite a cold person. So to be that submissive um, woman um, and, and to follow all their rules, which were very restrictive and very well um, pointed out, so you really didn't have uh, much uh, freedom with the rules. Um, it sort of it, it sort of really restricted how you connected with people and how you bonded and how you loved. So bringing on from what Jimmy said as well. So I mean, just really horrible things when people in our community were excommunicated. I, I would often think good. Um, and um, if something awful, when somebody passed away, I, I wasn't really overly upset, which is weird because they were going to come back in paradise. Um, and now I look back and think, wow, oh, I was so caught. I remember a, a friend of mine who was to see every week and spend time with him on the ministry. He, took, he sadly took his own life. He was the same age as me. And it, it took me back a week to get over it. And, and now I look back and think that's horrific. And I, I still feel ashamed <laughs> that that's how I was back then. And it's just really, really so different to who I am today. Um, so, that, yeah, let's, let's go on to the questions from the audience. We've got quite a few, actually. There's about eight questions here. Keep writing questions in. We might not have time to get through all of them. Um, so I'm just going to, if we could keep our answers short as well, um, and anybody's questions that aren't answered fully here, we, we can write answers in the in the in the end and other other speakers can do so too so um one person here has asked about covid what impact that it's had on these former religious communities um do we think that is encouraging more people to leave or are more people staying in emily what are you finding in um the with your organization are you are you finding more people or contacting you as a result of the pandemic has it impacted it at all um I think more people have been in touch with us because I think it's gave people time to reflect and think about their lives um I think people in miserable relation or unhappy relationships like living at home with parents who are overly controlling or wanting to make decisions or people in marriages who are unhappy um definitely I think more calls and sort of requests but um the actual reality of leaving um I don't think in total it's made people necessarily take the drastic action of actually leaving the community because I and again like I mentioned in my you know when I spoke earlier it really is really difficult so yeah I think yeah it that, is definitely yeah. I think we're finding in the ex Jehovah's Witness community that we are seeing more people leaving um and um we because they the community has like um quite a lot of meetings every week they go out door knocking and and so that the whole of their life is really um taken over by the by the religion 
they hold all their meetings now on Zoom and obviously in the comfort of their own home. And I think, like you said, Emily, that's giving people a chance to actually start and think because it's because it's so controlling you don't actually don't have it's probably difficult for some people to understand you actually don't have time to think and question that's it's, these religious groups are designed for in that way um yeah so i think i think the pandemic for some at least has um given them time to think i don't know did you have a quick comment on that one uh, jimmy or um, so i just think i think mortality you know this fear of death tends to increase religiosity actually right. like you know the more the more death becomes something close closer on the horizon um the more people are like oh better get my brownie points in with god to do more of my prayers and make sure uh, I'm fasting, all of that sort of stuff. I think it dials it up because you're worried that you might die, so you want to go to heaven because you haven't probably got 50 more years you might just have next month because the pandemic might kill you. Uh, that, and then I think there's something about a pandemic like COVID, which is so, um, it seems so universally applicable across all races and uh, cultures uh, and religions that they can't, twist it in the way that they would have done with HIV, which was a plague for the gays, you know? Like there's, there's not that, but if there was, if COVID was just hitting Christians, everyone else would be like, aha, this is from Allah showing you that the Christians and Jews are on the wrong path, but it, because it's hitting Muslims as well, that capability is, is not really there. Does it make sense? So true. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, Jimmy, mm. <laughs> it's so true. They've been disarmed by, by the virus from giving that. Mm. I'm just going to go to the next uh, audience question. Um, I'm probably not pronouncing your name right, but I think it's R Rory. It's a Gaelic name. Um, uh, they're asking, um, did we interact? I think they mean non-religious people when we were in our teen years and, and were beginning to question their religious tradition. And if so, what would you have liked to have heard from these uh, non-religious peers and how could they have helped or would it have been impossible to have? I'll quickly answer on behalf of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, we weren't allowed to be friends with anyone outside of the Jehovah's Witness religion. So that wasn't an option. So no, um, I didn't interact with with non-religious people Emily was that the same for you yeah definitely you know you didn't have friends outside of the community you didn't know people outside the community and that makes it harder to leave as well yeah that's well designed it's, it's deliberate you know because mm. you're going to leave everybody's not going to talk to the people that you know uh, and you don't know anybody in the outside world it also helps to reinforce that for us anyway the whole anti-semitism holocaust like the non-jews hate you they're out to get you um, it helps to reinforce that story because you have nothing else to counteract with. And surprising to me, actually, when I did start to leave and make connections, like, oh, people are so nice. And that yeah, was, you're yeah, surprised. Like... <laughs> Were you <laughs> surprised? I was surprised because you told all these stories about how evil everyone is on the outside world. Like, well, they're being nice to me. <laughs> they're not all prostitutes and drug dealers, which is what you've been told. And we genuinely were told that was us. <laughs> yeah, wow, they're really nice. So what a surprise. Jimmy, what did um what did did you have something to yes, say on that? So it's a bit different for it. It was. Because yeah. obviously so, you guys are allowed to talk to people who aren't Muslim. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we're, we're encouraged to have, not we're not encouraged to have non-Muslim friends, but I think, you know, because we're diaspora communities as well, it's kind of unavoidable, right? So, um, whereas if you're Muslim in Pakistan, that might not be the case, like you might not be encouraged, you might not have friends who are non-Muslim, uh, but we're instilled with such a sense of superiority about our religion, like, Christianity doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, is it three gods? Is it one God? What is this Holy Spirit Trinity? But it's all one. That's not even algebra or maths. It makes no sense. You know, the ridiculing that we had of other religions was so severe that anything that they said wouldn't have made sense. So any critique that they leveled, you know, like in Hindu, you had a God with an elephant's head riding around on a rat with a broken tusk so that he could write down poetry. Anything you have to say to me about my religion is just going to be absurd because from my perspective, I've been conditioned to think, you know, you're so superstitious and it makes no sense. You know, and now uh, as somebody outside of the religion, I can see that makes as much sense as walking around a black car bar, kissing a stone seven times, or walking around seven times, kissing a stone, throwing stones at the devil during your pilgrimage, right? But back then I was so conditioned that it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. But the difference between then and now 
is everybody seemed to have a religion back then, right? But if there were kids in my school who were atheists, so they weren't speaking to me to criticize my religion in order to make their religion more, show that their religion made more sense, that would have been more powerful. So if an atheist was just saying, actually, all of these religions don't make sense, yours doesn't make sense as much as everybody else's, and was questioning from that perspective, that would have been more useful for me. But how it manifested when I was in school was you either had Hindus, Christians, Jews, or Muslims, there were no Buddhists. Um, so, so the questioning was always from the position of my religion is better, yeah? yeah. And you know, as we're older now, like I, Hindus sorry, and Jews, to, um, sorry, it's more I'm like- about, <laughs> I'm about to limit you a little bit now. Sorry, Jimmy, it. we've, we've okay, only got sorry. about three minutes left. I'll just, just one more question from uh, the audience I want to address to Emily, really, from uh, somebody called Sarah. Um, is there anything that you feel that professional professionals from statutory agencies could do to gain access to individuals that need help and support to leave communities and prevent forced marriage? Well, do, do you have any thoughts on that, Emily? Yeah, I think more knowledge and more information to outside agencies, which people in the community would have access to for women, for example, like um, social workers or um, midwives, like in the healthcare service, like GPs. Um, I think dissemination of more knowledge about how these communities operate, because what I found was that people don't really understand what these communities are about. Um, the Haredi community, some people actually think it's really positive and really nice, but they don't really understand like you said, it's a cult and how controlling they are. So I think more awareness about what, what kind of control they exert over people, mm. uh, because the community obviously tried to sort of make it sound like, you know, we're wonderful, we help each other, but to really understand where, you know, people's lives and sort of um, choices are really limited. Um, I think that would make a difference when people do seek for help in domestic violence situations, um, women, women with children or, you know, um, like you know even men or you know with sort of looking for I'm just trying to think of ways in because these communities are so closeted I'm always trying to think of agencies that the community would interact with um to, to try and you know when we need them um but at least then there's some sort even the police force for example um just more knowledge about what these communities are about yeah 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 that's so important um and so that we we at faith to faithless are trying to address as well but i mean it's a huge job um and there are there are other groups out there trying to do that mm. too um we only have one minute left i'm just going to quickly address one last audience question um who has asked um he's mentioned or she has mentioned it seems there's a there are specific support groups for apostates from specific religious groups that we've founded um i wonder if if there are any um, that you know of for ex-born again Christians or evangelicals, Pentecostals who are in the UK, He's, this person is aware of them in the US only. Um, also how you unpick when such a group fits a lot of the criteria of a cult so it's helpful to have support around both or focus more on the cult aspects so I'll, ju I'll just I know address the first part because we don't have a lot of time um I if uh, we have ex-evangelical uh, people in uh, faith to faithless um if those uh, people would like to put in the chat an answer to this question, please do, because I don't know. I only know of support groups on Facebook. Um, and so it is worth searching on, on Facebook, but um, I, they, they do exist in the UK. So you can find a community. Um, but whether there are more um, structured groups as well, I don't know. So if anybody else here does know of ex-evangelical ex-born again um support groups uh, let us know but obviously at faith to faithless and um someone's going to put up a, a link in the uh, chat as well um we do arrange as we've mentioned before so, um peer support sessions and um, online socials. And we've had it, obviously, people from those groups join us. So that's a good way to connect with people there. Yes, yeah, so I can uh, see a link. I'm just going to see if I can type that into. No, I can't. Somebody will figure it out how to type that in there. <laughs> 
So um, that concludes our little session. Thank you. Thank you so much to Jimmy and Emily for telling your stories. Um, I know after these events, sometimes it could be, you might have told your story lots of times, sometimes it could be a bit tiring and, uh, you know, because you've given out so much of your, of your past. So I want people to recognise that this is, it is a big thing to come on and tell your story. So thank you so much for doing that. And I'm, and I'm sure given the amount of questions we've had, there's plenty in the audience who've got a lot out of um, what you've had to say today. So thank you. Uh, wish we had a little bit more time but there we go we're going to go for a break now um so i've gone over a little bit so um uh but we are back at 3 40 p.m and the next topic is let me remind myself a sec a third plenary is about the intersectionality between apostasy and mental health and we'll speak with dr jilly jenkinson and heather ransom thank you i will see you all in a bit Right, we've got our two panellists for our next session. So welcome back. Um, I'm really delighted to see so many of you here today and delighted that we've still got 48 participants. So I don't think we've had anyone really drop out, which is really great for an online webinar um, of this type. So um, my name is Claire Alcom Webber, for those who don't know me. I'm the head of humanist care at Humanist UK. Um, I feel very privileged to be chairing this session today because the speakers that we've got for you are extraordinarily knowledgeable in this field. Um, when we consider the intersectionality of apostasy and mental health, it's really vital for us to consider not only the considerable impact of leaving a high control religion on an individual's mental health, but also for us to explore that nuanced and highly specialised model that's necessary to support people, to help them assimilate their experiences and begin to recover. And um, our two speakers today will in turn explore both of those aspects. So Heather Ransom is a PhD researcher in psychology. Her current work focuses on the impact on um, identity. Sorry, my screen just disappeared for a second. Um, on uh, the impact on identity and mental health when leaving the Jehovah's Witness religion. She herself was born into the Jehovah's Witnesses and exited in 2014. And so she brings a deep personal understanding of these issues to her academic work. Her two recent journal publications, um, Grieving the Living and Life After Social Death, consider the identity transition and the impact of ostracism experienced by those who leave the JW community and give us a really excellent framework for understanding the process of leaving and the psychological needs of individuals who've left. Dr. Jilly Jenkinson has more than 20 years experience of psychotherapeutic work with survivors of religious, spiritual and cultic abuse. Her doctoral research focused on the phases of recovery for survivors and she trains therapists in the approaches required to support individuals who've left cults and high control religions. Jilly herself is a survivor of a cultic group and she's the founder of Hope Valley Counselling, one of the very few specialist therapeutic services in the UK for apostates. Jilly's work provides thorough and insightful approaches to meeting the needs of apostates and her understanding of the psychological journey of recovery is second to none. So like with previous sessions, we'll be taking um, questions and comments at the end during Q&A. So please just type them as they occur to you um, and I'll come to you at the end. But for now, I'll hand over to Heather for the first portion of the session. OK, so as Claire mentioned, I'm Heather and I'm a PhD student and I'm exploring the impact of religious exit from the Jehovah's Witnesses in the face of ostracism. Now, although my work is specifically in the area of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm quite sure that it's probably transferable across other religions, um, other high control religions that use ostracism as a tool to enforce conformity. Um, and this kind of this kind of ostracism is also encouraged to um, get people to return to the faiths from which they which they've left. Um, so thinking about the academic literature now, the phrase high cost religion, which is what I use in my work as re to describe religions like the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, is used in two different ways. So it's high cost in regards to the costs of membership, but also the costs of uh, leaving membership. So the costs of membership would be things like time and commitment. So for the Jehovah's Witnesses, that would involve um, preparing for and going to meetings and participating. Um, and also um, the preaching aspect of the faith, which is takes up a lot of time. And also things like going to meetings and going to what they call assemblies. And also the, the social 
um, aspect of that. So the costs of leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses are social and family costs. Um, and that's because leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses is typically associated with ostracism. So just briefly, uh, leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses, there tends to be two distinct routes. So firstly, you could be disfellowshipped, which is often the result of contravening a, um, a requirement of the faith, one of the doctrines perhaps. Um, and that um, results in immediate mandating sh mandated shunning from the Jehovah's Witness community. But also the, people can leave voluntarily. And I think more people tend to do this these days. Um, and in the past, that didn't really um, bring the same amount of shunning as disfellowship. But nowadays, it tends to be that, that both that do that. So you can leave voluntarily through disassociation, which is like a formal departure where you would perhaps write a letter um, to say you no longer wish to be known as a Jehovah's Witness. Or you can do what is called fading, which is when you just can't quite quietly cease um, participation and attendance. So when we think about, um, let's go to the next slide, when we think about religion, it's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? Because as this quote here from Gordon Allport, who was a psychologist, says, there's something about religion that unmakes prejudice and something about religion that makes prejudice. So it's a bit of a paradox because on the one hand, religion is posited to be a healing balm, isn't it? It's supposed to bring people comfort and to bring people help. And yet other you know, it, it's plain through history that religion has also been the source of a great deal of conflict and indeed um, ostracism. So this presentation is going to be based on two published pieces of work that I've been doing over the last three years as part of my studies. So first of all, I'm going to look at a quantitative piece of work um, that uses statistics and objective measurements, and this is the first of its kind to do so. And then we're going to have a look at my um, other piece of work, which is a qualitative one, which uses an interview schedule. Um, so I'm just going to move this out of the way so I can read my screen. OK, so this is the first um, the first piece. So this is the quantitative piece, life after social death. The reason we call that was because people's experiences of shunning was often described as a social death. So this piece of research examines statistically the extent to which former Jehovah's Witnesses experiences of shunning were associated with um, reduced mental health, psychological well-being, but also identity reformulation. So we recruit, recruited 554 adults and we used path analysis, which is a statistical method to test the pathways between different exit methods, different commitment levels, and also post-exit identification with groups, because obviously you, you go from being in a group um, of Jehovah's Witnesses to being in a group that obviously is not Jehovah's Witnesses and the effect that that would have on your identity. Um, okay, next one. So although it's quite an in-depth paper, which is open access actually, so if you wanted to have a look at the statistics, if you like things like statistics, then feel free to have a look at that. But what did we find? We found that you, ostracism was ubiquitous across the board for all individuals who leave the Jehovah's Witnesses. However, we found that ostracism was reported more by individuals who left voluntarily rather than forced. Now, this was a bit of a paradox, really, and it was contrary to our hypothesis because we thought that disfellowship, which is associated with mandated shunning, would bring about more um, ostracism. So that made us think about, well, why, why could this be? And the only thing that we could think of is the fact that voluntary exit would be a, an unexpected outcome of that would be shunning when somebody has left the religion and haven't particularly um, gone against any of the rules, so to speak. We also found that commitment levels mediated self-esteem and depression, and that indicated that leaving a religion like the Jehovah's Witnesses doesn't take a linear path, that different factors can converge to give different outcomes. But we also found that um, in terms of um, fear and guilt, that um, identification with, um, how can I put it, um, groups that are set up for former Jehovah's Witnesses to garner new social ties, et cetera. In one way, it was beneficial, but in other ways, it was um, associated with lower self-esteem. And we thought possibly that was the reason was because 
um, during membership of the Jehovah's Witnesses, that would be considered an apostate thing to do. Now, the word apostate um, is a very loaded and triggering word in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And it's, it, it's been instilled a deep fear into Jehovah's Witnesses of this word. And so association with ex-Jehovah's Witness groups, there could be a strong association there with apostasy, which is why we may have got that um, finding. Um, okay, so we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna go on to the next paper. So this is Grieving the Living, the Social Death of Former Jehovah's Witnesses. So the last paper looked at quantitative work, which is great to find out um, what is happening. But if you want to find out why something is happening and how that feels, then qualitative work excels because there we use uh, an interview schedule and, and we speak to people about, about how that feels. So we have a look at the quotes here. Everyone I knew was a Jehovah's Witness. You're taught to have no friends outside the religion. Who was I when I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness? I was nobody. I felt invisible. It's like being in a big ocean in a tiny boat and no one to rescue you. You don't have a feeling of belonging anymore. You feel lost. It was hard to interact with people. I didn't know how to do life as a non-Jehovah's Witness. I didn't have any non-Jehovah's Witness friends. And finally, you don't know who you are because you've been conditioned to think and feel in a certain way. You don't know yourself at all. So I'm sure you can see from these quotes here how identity is um, affected when people leave the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, one notable finding that we did have was that individuals who were born and raised in the Jehovah's Witnesses tended to experience um, an identity crisis, as these quotes relate, whereas converts didn't. So converts, people who converted to the religion as an adult, tended to revert back to their pre-Jehovah's Witness identity. Um, so from a mental health perspective, it's very important to find out whether a person was born and raised in, in the religion that they, are, that they have left. Um, because being raised in religions like the Jehovah's Witnesses are very, um, they mold your identity. And in that way, um, it's because you are taught how to think and how to feel. Um, you are told what you can watch, what you can't watch, what you can eat, what you can't eat. Um, where, even where you can't work, work or where you, um, what you can't wear or even what you, you can celebrate or not celebrate. So no Christmas, birthdays, Easter, Mother's Day, etc. But also the social restrictions to who you can mix with. Um, and that would include non-Jehovah's Witness family, your own family to some extent. So these identity defining features mean that when people leave, they often don't fit, feel like they fit into like mainstream society. And that can result in tremendous feelings of alienation and loneliness. So as I mentioned before, there are two ways of leaving the religion. So these quotes on the next page are from people who were disfellowshipped to get, give you a, a, a flavor of what that feels like. So I'll have a look at those. So it has total, it has control of your mind. You're made to feel repugnant, like you're a dog returning to its vomit. So how can you feel worthwhile? It makes you feel like you're dirty. It's like being in the film, I am legend, like the whole world has died. Mum doesn't want anything to do with me. My self-esteem took a massive hit. I felt like I'd been in a car crash. It was a very black time in my life. I literally had no one. I was totally shunned by everyone. I nearly drank myself to death. I lost so much weight. So it was obvious from the data that being disfellowshipped was associated with feelings of like self-loathing, shame and embarrassment from many participants. And that seemed to stem from two main reasons. So the first one is, is the public nature of the disfellowshipping process, where that's announced from a platform that you are and no longer a Jehovah's Witness, which means you're disfellowshipped. And if, especially if you're there in, in, in attendance for that, um, that would elicit feelings of shame, embarrassment, it's very humiliating. But also importantly, it does trigger immediate shunning from um, everybody there, the whole, Jehovah's Witness, the whole Jehovah's Witness community. And that has catastrophic impacts on a person's social and family life. It's like losing everybody overnight. In fact, one respondent said um, 
that it was like all her family and friends had died in a car crash, in a, sorry, in a, in a plane crash. And this is exacerbated as well if, like in many cases, you're from a multi-generational family of Jehovah's Witnesses, where literally you can lose, you know, both sides of your, of your um, family tree, so to speak. So the emotional upheaval is, is very strong. So I said there was two main reasons for that. So the second reason is more to do with the doctrine of the religion. So if, if you're a Jehovah's Witness that's been disfellowshipped, but you're still a believer, so you still believe it's the truth, so to speak, then your chance of everlasting life in paradise, which is every Jehovah's Witness's um, reward, that's why they're in the religion, and that's what they're all looking forward to, um, that's now out of your reach. And instead, all you've got to look forward to is your own death at Armageddon, which also Jehovah's Witnesses believe is God's war against wickedness. Um, and that is expected imminently. So that could be tomorrow, it could be next week, next month, next year, or it could be in 10 years time. So there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty associated with um, disfellowship. So again, for mental health practitioners, I'm sure you can see that having an awareness of these doctrines and these feelings um, may aid in the understanding of how people may present and therefore maybe how um, treatment can be tailored. So the next slide deals specifically with mental health and suicide and suicidal ideation. So just having a look at these quotes here, I wanted to die, I couldn't eat. I didn't want to wake up in the morning. Imagine every part of your body having a pin in it. That's what it felt like. I wished I wasn't breathing because then I couldn't feel the pain. Losing my son, that was to suicide, was indirectly caused by his involvement with the Jehovah's Witness, his upbringing and his being shunned. Your whole life you're in fear of Armageddon, living in fear that Jehovah is watching you, that Armageddon's coming and you're going to die. The pressure was just too much. I nearly drank myself to death. And finally, I twice took an overdose. I lost so much weight, my teeth looked too big for my face. So I'm sure you can see there, and that's just a small selection of quotes from the study, that the data revealed that the impacts to mental health from disfellowship are, are really quite severe, suicidal ideation and, and suicide, and also physical effects, weight loss, alcoholism, self-destructive behavior, and also reports of feelings of helplessness. And it's interesting that one of the respondents talked about um, it felt like her body having a pin in it because the uh, literature talks about the um, studies that have been done on social pain, ostracism. So in fMRI, stu fMRI studies, the part of the brain that lights up with physical pain also lights up with social pain, showing that there's a connection there an indication that, you know, that kind of pain is not just um, meta metaphorical. And when you think about it as well, those studies, they just use manipulated ostracism. So that can't really compare to somebody who's been ignored, um, ostracized by somebody they love very much and has been for, for a long time. So it's no wonder that mental health problems can ensue. And some participants in the study have been ostracized for 10, 20, 25 years. So they've lost out on a lot of their family experiences. Uh, one respondent cried as she told me about her son who'd uh, taken his own life because he couldn't cope with the, the isolation from the shunning. And these are not isolated incidents. So I'm, I've got three more studies ongoing at the moment that are not published as yet. But again, that, that is an ongoing theme. Um, this this uh, correlation between disfellowship and suicide and suicidal ideation. So before we finish, because it's 16 minutes already, um, just a brief summary of what it's important to know about apostates or important to know about people who have left, um, you know, this kind of religion. So first of all, it's important to know whether a person has been disfellowshipped or whether they've left a religion through choice, because um, maintaining or retaining a sense of agency or control in the leaving process seems to be much less damaging to mental health than leaving through choice. Um, and if you think about it, because these types of religions are quite insular in their outlook, um, they teach that it's necessary to be separate from the world, so to speak. When people leave um, religions like the Jehovah's Witnesses, 
they could be leaving the only community that they've ever known. Um, and they find it very difficult to integrate into the world. So I think this is why in the studies I've conducted that disfellowship, and, disfellowship is often associated with suicide and suicidal ideation. However, that being said, um, it's also important to realize that individuals who leave through choice also suffer significantly from the impact of ostracism. This is not just people who are, are disfellowshipped. Although having a sense of free will in the process of leaving maybe helps mental health, um, it doesn't um, reduce the impact of, of losing your um, entire support network. So that, that's important to say as well. And in saying that, findings from my research also indicate that whether people leave the, the religion through choice or disfellowship, um, I would say the majority, the vast majority, all um, have a form of um, counselling afterwards because they need to be able to cope with that. So it's also important to ascertain whether a person was born into a religion or at least raised according to the doctrine because the impact of childhood indoctrination is very strong. And that's because for individuals who are raised in religions like these, the impact to identity is such that it's difficult to integrate into society afterwards. And that can leave people feeling that they have nowhere to belong, which is you know, bad for mental health especially if they're part of a multi-generational family. So in this case, people can lose their entire family structure as well as all their friends, parents, grandparents, siblings, even their own children at times. So that, that insular nature of religions is fine during membership because there's a, there's a good support network there, but not, um, not post-exit. And then finally, um, and this in most cases follows on from indo childhood indoctrination, is whether the individual still believes in Armageddon, especially um, because the, the doctrine of Armageddon is quite a frightening prospect. So the, the impact that the, on, on, your, on your well-being that you believe that the world is about to end at any time um, has tremendous repercussions on mental health. It's hard to function if you always feel like you're on death row, so to speak. In fact, there's been quite a few documented suicides and murder suicides in the media uh, where people who have taken these extreme measures because they've truly believed that the world is about to end. And by taking their life, they may be thinking that they're banking on a chance of getting a resurrection in the future paradise, which is another fundamental belief of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So therefore, it's very important for members of um, fundamentalist religious groups to unpack, unpick sorry, the doctrine in order to free their mind. And it's important for mental health practitioners to be aware of the doctrines so that they, because they can make a personal seem quite irrational. So I hope I've been able to enlighten you there as to the fears that former Jehovah's Witnesses may present with. There's a real need for understanding of how this problem um, can affect exodus of high cost religions and, in, and Therefore, this form of education is very important to help apostates recover. So there's the two articles that um, I was talking about, and they are open access for anybody to read. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. If I can work out how to do that. There we go. Thank you so much, Heather. I think that was it's so hard to condense into 20 minutes, isn't it? Just how incredibly rich your research is um, and those those really important messages that are coming out of it. I think for people who don't really understand this sector and people's journey, there can be that sense that, well, you know, well, when you've left, you're free, you should be jubilant, you know, you, you've you released from your, your chains. Um, but actually that, that deep impact on people's identity and the sadness and the pain that they carry with them after the process of leaving is so important to identify. Um, and I think those quotes that you put up really do show that incredibly well. Um, and also I think you the, the thread that has gone through some of our sessions today about the, the fear that keeps people um, subservient, that keeps people in those religions um, and those cults is, is so clear, you know, with the way that you're talking about Armageddon um, and the fear that people have of what's going to happen to them. Um, it, it's no surprise, is it, that people have such significant impacts on their mental health? 
um, as yeah. a result of being in these groups. So thank you so much. That was um, it was a, a really really great condensation of all of the things that you're discovering and that you know. So thank you. Um, so following on from that, I'd like to bring um, Dr. Julie Jenkinson in to give her presentation around the therapeutic models and the way that we can help people towards recovery. Okay, thank you, Heather, that was fantastic. And uh, Heather and I have already talked a bit about our slot and there's some overlaps here. Uh, so here we go. So um, this quote, so nobody likes to lose a customer, but religions get more touchy than most when faced with the risk of losing devotees they have come to define as their own. Historically, many religions have gone to great lengths to prevent apostasy, believing virtually any means justified to prevent wavering parishioners from defecting and thus losing hope of eternal salvation. Uh, that's Ben the Blocky in his book, Misunderstanding Cult. Um, and I thought that was a very pertinent quote. So I'm going to try and mainly refer to high demand groups or religions, I tend to use the term cult actually most of the time, and people who come and see me as a therapist have already identified their group as a cult. But uh, there's a lot of crossover with religious trauma syndrome, spiritual abuse, all of those things. Um, so Heather's already mentioned this, and you probably already know, but um, those, they're different populations within this client group. So if you're a therapist or uh, providing services, it's important to, uh, to know this, that those who were recruited or joined as an adult are first generation and they have experienced before, as, as Heather said. And it's really interesting that her findings are that people revert to their pre-high demand group identity. Second generation or SGAs had little or no experience other than the group uh, as a child and until they leave. And multi-generation, and again, Heather mentioned this, parents, even grandparents, et cetera, and others have talked about this today, you know, may be raised in. And so they have literally, some people have literally no experience other than the group as a child and until they leave. And I think probably, um, the apostate stories from the section before, there were those there who could relate to that. So there, Jill Mitten in her research has um, coined the term multi-generation adults and has written a very good paper on it. Um, so, so what do policymakers and mental health professionals need to look out for? Well, we've got a very short time. I could talk on this for about um, a week. So anyway, um, so for my master's and then my doctoral research, I conducted, well, for my doctoral research, I conducted qualitative grounded theory study, and I interviewed 29 former members, all of whom were apostates, uh, had left some kind of high demand group, and I asked them, what helped you recover? And, you know, so in, in the process of them answering the question of what helped you recover, of course, a whole big story came and I, I ended up coding it in, in a fairly obvious way really which was that many who were first generation were saying about life before then I got the story of life in and the fundamentalist mindset of members then leaving and the trauma and relief of leaving and then life after and the mental health challenges and the fallout and harm caused by both life in and leaving and then um actually what came out of it was actually for in terms of providing services and things that there are really four phases of recovery and i'll come back to that so i'm just going to look at these very quickly and briefly and i'm sorry it's a bit of a rush so for those um life before is relevant to those who joined as adults and has some bearing on apostasy issues and, and Heather's also raised some stuff around that. They have an identity to return to and they may 
and probably have friends and family to return to if the family will accept them. I'm first generation and my family thankfully accepted me back. Life in, well, it's really important for people providing um, services to understand the high demand group or the cult mindset, as I called it in my doctorate, and uh, in order to understand the, the whole experience, really. And that's quite a challenge, um, gaining that understanding, actually. So being a member can be reassuring. You know, you feel as if you have the truth. It provides certainty and an existential security if you comply. It, it, you know the rules. It gives you a community of people to belong to. You, you don't need to go and look for friends. They're all there. You know, you just accept people within that group. It can be exciting. You know, you might be traveling the world with the group or you might be doing various things. You know, it can be life enhancing, um, as Heather said about, you know, the spiritual religious side can have benefits. And it gives this particular sense of identity of being affiliated. But it can also be stifling, claustrophobic, controlled, intolerable, traumatic, depressing, debilitating, filled with fear, if not terrifying. And we've heard a bit today about Armageddon or, you know, you'll be killed if you if you um, leave. So, you know, your life's filled with a lot of fear, personally insecure, because if you step out of line, you'll get into trouble. And then you get you in it results in a loss of what I've called um, an authentic, autonomous and I've added here creative identity that your identity is is solely for the group and I've actually called this the cult pseudo identity but that's another whole talk I don't name groups um particularly but um cult 101 cult news 101 is actually they report news that comes out endlessly in the press and stuff and you can get to know stuff about groups through them so again leaving so Heather's talked about this, you can be thrown out or expelled, cast away, disfellowshipped, um, depends on the, the type of group or the language that each group uses. There might be, and, and shunned, which is an exceptionally painful and um, terrible thing to experience. There might be a planned leaving. So. I've known people who saved up money, they managed to squirrel it away and then finally leave. There's so many, so many stories. Maybe someone found someone on the outside they could trust. Someone intervened and got them out. So they call that exit counseling. They found information about high demand groups and cults online or from a therapist, and then they wake up, as some people call it. Now, Marietta said, after she left, she said, I felt like I'd been beamed down to planet Earth, you know, this from this spaceship, which was the cult. And I was now living with all these aliens and it was very scary and weird. And Lavinia said, well, they left because they were, let's say, standing on a precipice and didn't feel like they had any other options. There was nowhere to go. Then all of a sudden, it's like being forced out into a foreign land by yourself. And I mean, those echo very much with some of the, the, the quotes from Heather, I thought. So leaving can be a relief. It can be exciting for the new start. It can be life enhancing. It can be freeing, exhilarating. And, and, and it can also be dangerous due to hate crimes and threat to, to life, family and property, and I've heard that uh, over this conference, can be catastrophic, especially if family and friends reject or shun you. It can leave a mark for many years to come, if not that their whole life. And especially if they don't get the help they deserve and need, and I'll address recovery at the end. So I thought I'd give you a picture. <laughs> I think, you know, the need to understand membership and the fallout that 
of leaving, you know, membership can make people very unhappy, extremely, exceptionally, and that was the case for me. And then leaving just can exacerbate the whole thing because on top of all the, the pressures within, then there's all the pressures of being out. So life after and mental health challenges, well, there's so much here and I'll zoom through these, but, um, you know, leaving can, leaving can leave the apostate feeling terrified. Heather talked about Armageddon, like a traitor. You know, I'm a traitor of my family and, and my friends, like a weirdo. Uh, I'm an alien from another planet. Like people aren't going to understand different to others around them, unable to understand society around them, have adjustment disorders, confused, lost, lonely, rejected, grief and loss. And it's a disenfranchised grief, which is, you know, um, a grief that society doesn't understand. And so, you know, can you feel ambivalent and indecisive, fearful, all of these things. And apostates lack preparation for life outside. They may have these conflicts with loved ones to deal with, difficulty in expressing themselves, financial needs and financial sensitivity and sexual confusion after being in a purity culture and, you know, having sexuality and sex life prescribed for them. And, you know, there's, there can be hypersensitivity to others pushing their faith on them. Uh, confusion about beliefs, theological rigidity, you know, so many things. Um, and also questions about, you know, how long is this going to last? Will I ever feel better? How long does it take to feel better? Will others understand me? Who will help me and support me? Um, and I, I think actually a key thing for therapists to know is that, that those who lead these groups don't actually have an internal roadmap that we're talk that's talked about in humanistic therapy training. You know, we need people need help to understand what actually happened to them. And uh, that was said earlier. I think Joy was saying this, who works with the Family Survival Trust. Um, you know, and so these issues are often not seen or recognised. And Apostates may be reticent to share their experience because of shame or terror. It's really embarrassing to say you've been part of this sort of group. Or there's a fear that God or, or their God may punish them for betraying the, the God or the, the group. And apostates are in danger of cult hopping, joining a similarly abusive group or relationship whilst not recognizing the dynamics are the same. So people can end up in a domestic abuse relationship thinking it doesn't look like what they've just left but actually it's exactly the same and they haven't got enough knowledge about what happened before not to repeat it and then drugs alcohol suicides homelessness you know are, are serious issues and and actually I think specialist mental health provision is pretty well non-existent and I've been told so many times by people coming to me, and I'm only one therapist, that, that they've been in therapy for years and never actually even addressed the high demand group. And um, so, so people generally don't understand what they've been through, don't understand what they've left behind. And also another mistake can be being really voyeuristic. Oh, that's interesting. Were you in a cult? Or, you know, that's really interesting. And, and actually, that isn't therapeutic, and it can be very traumatizing. So what helps? Four phase, this is what came out of my PhD, four phases of recovery and growth. So to, in order to recover, I think we need to leave physically and begin to leave psychologically. I think while we're still in, it's really hard to fully recover. Then phase two, we need to cognitively understand the group dynamics. And this was said earlier today. And that's a focus on psychoeducation. And then we need to do the emotional healing. If you start focusing on emotional healing before understanding, then you start working with the pseudo identity, the, the high demand group or cult identity. 
and that person hasn't really found their authentic identity. And then um, the phase four is moving on in post-traumatic growth. And someone asked earlier about post-traumatic growth and I covered that in my PhD. And yes, it is possible. So that's my PhD, it's at the University of Nottingham. So post-cult counselling, sorry, you've lost um, that at the top, it, it, I, the work that I provide is post-cult counselling, it's in phase two, and it's what I call relational psychoeducation, which helps make sense in a therapeutic relationship. And it's psychoeducational worksheets that are put together in a particular way in a loose leaf folder. And the psychoeducation, and I'm finishing now, um, the psychoeducation leads to understanding, and it really does. And it starts to undo um, the effects of, the, of being in that group. And so we, we're working on building an authentic identity. What was your cult pseudo identity like? What did you like? What didn't you like? And of course, this is slightly different for first and second generation, but it works for both. Then we in, identify what I call introjects or faulty beliefs that, the, you know, so many things that it's selfish to think about myself or it's selfish to have a holiday or God will strike me down if I do this. And so, I mean, just they're, they're endless almost. We deal with setting boundaries. We deal with finding a voice. H how can you kind of ramp up your self-love comes within that. We look at trauma theory. What's basic trauma theory? So you can learn to understand what's happening in my body. How can I ground myself? And then one of the key areas is applying thought reform or brainwashing theory. So really unpack the whole group experience through looking through the prism of thought reform. And then we look at unmasking the cult leadership seeing them as a human rather than a godlike person. And that was the biggest category within my PhD by far was unmasking the cult leader. Um, so um, I've written this up in a book, a uh, chapter. Um, I don't think you're having the slides, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's me and that's the end. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We've got a bit of time for questions. <laughs> I always have too much to say. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jilly. I, I think, like you said, we, we could talk about this for weeks, just this session. It is such fascinating, important work, um, thinking about this. Um, I've just got a couple of little sort of admin bits to pick up on. Um, I'm hoping to collate slides for people. Okay. There will be a report coming out in the autumn, um, bringing together all of the learning from this conference and all those things. So I will be asking panellists um, if they're happy to share their slides. So um, I know there's an awful lot of information um, and websites and things on there that people might want. So um, watch this space. Um, also, I'm aware that there's a couple of people who've got their hands up. Um, unfortunately, in this format, we're not unable to unmute people's mics. So please just type your questions into the Q&A box and I will go through them with our speakers. So we've got a few questions here. Um, the first one, which is, um, I think for you, Heather, um, as part of leaving religion and changing identity, oh no, sorry, it's for Faith to Faithers more generally, does Faith to Faithers offer an advice and assistance to individuals on changing their legal names through statutory declaration and other means? So, um, I mean, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of Faith to Faithless on this one. We don't specifically have that sort of advice, but we do signpost people to organisations that can help, to help for websites and give them some support in doing that. Um, we've had links already put into the chat about the peer support groups and the socials, and those are really good ways of people sort of getting in um, and you know, finding some support from like-minded people. I've also just been reminded that actually Humanist UK obviously as a whole um, offer naming ceremonies. And that is something that can be really useful for people. Actually, if they are wanting to um, embrace a new identity for themselves and change their name, that actually having a ceremony and a ritual that they can craft for themselves is really, really helpful in that, that transition process as part of that journey. Um, my, the second question that's in the chat is for Heather. 
so um, it says, thank you so much for your important work from an XJW. Did you consider if those who dissociate are more shunned as they've made an active choice and are less likely to return? Um, maybe while those who are disfellowshipped have made like a one-off mistake? Did you see any difference there? Of course. Um, so did you consider that um, whether those who dissociate are more shunned as they've made an active choice and they're less likely to return? Whereas on the flip side, those who are disfellowshipped may have been seen as sort of making a one-off mistake. Yeah, it is possible. There was this is the thing with the difference between quantitative and qualitative work, because with quantitative mm -hmm. work, you're getting people to fill in questionnaires and you just get an overall an overview of, of what the answer is. But it's when you delve into the qualitative stuff and actually ask people that you get more of an idea. So the mm -hmm. overarching thing with disfellowship and disassociation, I suppose disassociation was was um, it's almost like taking your life back. Um, I, I view the whole thing a, a bit like um, work. So if you if you're disfellowshipped, it's like you've been sacked from your job, which is a very mm. embarrassing, horrible thing to go through. Not that I've ever been sacked, but I'm sure it is. Um, whereas disassociation is like I don't know going out going out the front door and slamming it behind you. You know, it was your choice. Mm. Whereas fading, which is what most people do, which is um, it's almost like creeping out the back door. So mm -hmm. there's, there's no big, with disassociation, it's very formal. So people will, and some people are very, feel very strongly about, about that whole disassociation thing. For me, personally, this has nothing to do with my research. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get disfellowshipped, n neither did I disassociate because I didn't want to give them the power of having a label to mm -hmm. stick on me. I thought, well, no, I don't have to disassociate. Um, I haven't broken any of the rules so they couldn't disfellowship me so for mm. me I just thought no I don't have to assign myself a disassociated label mm. but for some people they feel differently it's 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 very empowering to disassociate so I think mm. that is maybe a individual differences thing and maybe it depends on your experience and it might also depend on what family you've got in the religion because this mm. was another finding that people that converted when they left, it was almost like they got their family back. Whereas mm -hmm. when people leave that are multi-generational, they lose everybody. And so they are more likely to try the fading route and, and not do it formally because then they might not get shunned. Mm -hmm. Most people do, but some people might not get shunned. I think it depends on your, on your family, really. Yeah. I got shunned. <laughs> There's actually a, a follow up question that picks up on some of your answer there. So do you see any difference um, between those who went through sort of official dissociation to those who faded? Not so much between those two. No, I wasn't really um, looking at the differences between voluntary exit. Mm. Um, I was I was tending more to look at the difference between forced and voluntary exit. So I've tended to put disassociation and fading under the same umbrella so to speak mm. so it, it was all to do with having that sense of agency that sense of control that you, you've left through choice um, and it was true that I know the quantitative piece um, indicated that leaving through choice elicited more ostracism mm. but I think that might be some kind of I don't know glitch and not a glitch <laughs> but I think it must be that the the ostracism scale couldn't account for things um, whereas the qualitative work was much clearer that um, although both lots of, of people were ostracized and lost a lot of, of their social contacts and family contacts mm -hmm. ostracism seems to do something to people's mental health yeah. and the whole point of me doing this research was because I left the religion voluntarily and although um, it did give me a great deal of anxiety and depression because of the losses. When I reconnected with people that I'd disconnected with from when I was a Jehovah's Witness and they'd been disfellowshipped and then I reconnected with them, it was apparent, very apparent to me that those that have been disfellowshipped seem to um, suffer more with their mental health. And that was what actually inspired my PhD, that I needed to find out what it was. And it seems to be mostly this, this sense of agency of being forced to do something or whether whether you do something through choice. But the I do need to distinguish really between um, the different types of voluntary exit, fading and disassociation. 
because there's not I've, I've not really concentrated on that so much yeah I think it's so interesting isn't it there are so many different nuances and strands oh, to so start many. unpicking once you get into it and the that individual experience is so different you know there might be common themes but yeah it's so important to understand that from an individual perspective isn't it thank you um i've got a couple of questions that have come in for jilly um so one is uh with the four phases do you find that people go forwards and backwards through them like the stages of grief tends to well yes it's not linear and in the phd i i, I mean it was describing a theory it was sort of linear but then I, I drew, I mapped it out and then I drew an arrow going back, you know, that there's times we need to revisit the phases. Um, I think it's a guide really of when to do what, when to focus on what. Brilliant, thank you. And um, another one for yourself really from a therapeutic perspective, do you have a view on the impact of fading from any religious background? where the family still perceives someone as religious because they haven't overtly spoken out or up against the religion um and do you think that not speaking out overtly perhaps makes it harder to leave psychologically i i have come across a number of people you know who've who've sort of left and maybe left the town or moved away mm -hmm. and the family probably think they must have moved away but they're not quite mm. sure i i suspect the identity has to split a bit more for that i i mm. think that that there's sort of the cult identity that they're working on the authentic identity and then they're having to present something to the family to sort of keep the peace mm. it does wear thin i have to say um but um yeah, it, it maybe slows down recovery in some ways, but not necessarily. Um, I suppose that has some overlaps with what, what Heather was saying about that individual decision about whether to go through the formal process of it yeah. and it be a, a definitive step yeah. Yeah. or whether it's it's something slower. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's just such an individual process, isn't it? People? It really is. and it But it can be really annoying for people who've left, who've tried to move away and the family spend the whole time telling them they need to be reading their Bible and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> They're like, and how am I going to manage this, you know, and tell them, will you please stop doing that? Cause I can't mm. tell them. So they're having to deal. So it can be pretty difficult to deal with, but yeah. Brilliant. Uh, we've got a couple more that have come in. Um, are either of you aware of any research looking into the link between cluster B personalities and cults? I don't even know what that is. No, I don't know what that is. No, that's a quick answer then. I think that's <laughs> very I niche. Yeah. Um, another one. Um, are there distinct stages of deconversion? And could you explain what each stage is if there are? I suppose this is probably mostly for Jilly, but Heather also. I mean, ooh, I, I, I mean, there's so much to say about that. Like Heather, you probably have something to say. I mean, I think if, if I put it in very, my brain always goes to simple, uh, simple explanation. Mm. I think people kind of start you know with the process of doubting I used mm. talked a lot in my PhD well there was a whole category on thinking the unthinkable thought actually was was the, mm. the code was like oh my goodness if I think this thought then I might have to leave and oh my goodness mm. everything's kind of going to come crashing down so so there's stages when you're in of of um actually uh starting to doubt and then a kind of one participant talked about being in a marble edifice within that high demand setting and that you need a crack and when the mm. crack starts then then the doubts can begin sometimes mm. there's a crack from outside that occurs if someone has exit counseling or an intervention to to try and get them out of the group and sometimes that starts from within 
So then there's going to be stages of, you know, then, oh no, what am I going to do next? And things Heather's sort of referred to the, the steps and stages. People who come and see me have usually been through quite a lot of that process. They've been out for mm. some time. I don't do exit counselling. I help them to make sense of what mm. happened. Heather, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, it's, it does seem to be a process and it's different for different mm. people. I think sometimes it can be a trauma. So something can happen in your life um, and, and that will trigger off other processes, uh, maybe a bit of cognitive dissonance. I mean, for me, mm. it, it was it was the shunning that aspect. Uh, and it was when I started to having to shun people from my life as a Jehovah's Witness um, that I remember thinking to myself, how many people, more people do I have to lose? And I've got four children. I thought, well, does that mean when my child, if any of my children mm. leave, I'm going to have to shun them? And I'm sorry, but that wouldn't, I just couldn't do that. Yeah. And then I thought, well, what's the point of staying in a religion where I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do that? So cognitive dissonance. And also you've got that transition of, I found this as well in the research that some, some respondents were almost scared to research the origins of the Jehovah's Witness religion. And mm -hmm. I think again, that's the association with apostasy. Mm -hmm. um, whereas those who did um, engage in, in research so for me, I compared the Jehovah's Witness Bible to the King James Bible, just comparing scriptures, just mm. doctrinally, because I'm the kind of person that has to, I have to know that I'm doing the right thing. Whereas other people have said to me, no, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I'm not going back, but I don't want to know, don't tell me anything. And it's they've got mm. this, this fear of research. Mm. And I think if you've got that fear of research, it can put you in like, um, like a mental prison, you know, like I said to you before mm. about, the, about Armageddon that you're literally sat on death row waiting for Armageddon to start. And, and you, you can't really transition your identity to, to find your um, authentic identity because you're trapped in this mm -hmm. old identity through fear, which is often through the childhood ind indoctrination. So it's often that cycle. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think that cycle and that journey really, those are the things I capture. It's not a, a linear, simple process. No, it's not. Is it? um, so we've just got a few a few minutes left. I just wanted to mention that um, Faith to Faithless runs apostasy safeguarding training for professionals, and in that we unpack a little bit about the apostate journey and those those sort of phases that people go through. Um, also, someone has asked Jilly, could you share the details of that book again because they didn't catch yeah. it? So would you be able to put it into the chat? Yeah. Um, for everyone to see screenshot <laughs> okay if people are able to see that and then you can just search for it i'm sure you will find it thank you that's well, great and it, it, yeah and perfect uh, um, I'll stick it in the chat when we come out of this session and lovely that's brilliant thank you and we've just got time for one last question if we're very quick so do you have any thoughts on the impact on the individual when the ostracism isn't absolute so for example if most family members disown the individual but one doesn't and how could this differ from a scenario where the individual is completely cut off so we've got two minutes to answer that well in my experience it's really helpful to have somebody you know it's mm. heartbreaking but it, having somebody is a step in the right direction Hmm. it is it is but on the other hand it's also very confusing is it um it's also very confusing if 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 most of your family are shunning you but then one person does and then that again it, it just makes you question why you know why is there hmm. no uniformity and i think for me it just underlines the fact that it is just another cult-like religion um hmm. so in some ways it can be in some ways it can be a comfort but i think in other ways it can be quite hurtful as well. I was thinking of another family member who'd already left, actually, uh, that there's a comfort oh, right. someone else has left. If they're all still in, well, mm. it'd be unlikely, yeah. I suppose, to have someone who's on your side. Mm. Maybe. And they just follow up with a uh, followed up with a comment saying that it, it could, if there's someone still inside, that it could allow that one person to continue to pressure you if yeah. you're in touch so I suppose it's, it's hugely complex yeah. so we are out of time yeah um thank you so much both of you I mean that was um an incredibly interesting session I think it's given us an awful lot to think about and consider in the way that we need to support people and what their needs are so we've got another 10 minute break now
so we'll come back at 10 to 5 for our final plenary session, which is on the future of human rights for apostates. So um, everyone go stretch your legs, grab a drink, and we will see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, let's make a start then. Um, so thank you very much um, to everybody who's uh, coming uh, to this uh, the last panel session of the day um, and sorry that we're starting a couple of minutes late. Uh, my name is Richie Thompson, I'm the Director of Public Affairs and Policy at Humanist UK uh, which means I oversee our various uh, campaigns work including our work in support of uh, Apple States. Um, this event um, as you all know uh, is focused on uh, the human rights of apostates um, both in the UK um, and beyond. Um, I will say a bit in due course about um, some of the work we've been doing around the human rights of apostates in the UK. Um, but um, before I do that, um, we've got two fantastic speakers to hear from about, um, uh, about um, this issue and uh, what they've been doing um, from different angles, namely uh, Lily Ashworth and Nilifer Rahim. Um, so I'm going to come to uh, Lily first and then to Nilifa um, to introduce both of them. Uh, Lily has been the advocacy officer at Humanist International since uh, April last year. Uh, she works to defend the rights of humanists and the non-religious, uh, including advocating for the worldwide repeal of laws against blasphemy and apostasy and works to promote humanist values, including universal human rights, reason and science at the UN and other international institutions. Um, while Nilifer is the research director at the National Centre for Social Research at NatSen, uh, she has more than a decade's experience of managing qualitative and mixed method research programmes and she was the lead editor on the British Social Attitudes Survey in 2019, uh, which contained a chapter uh, on religion. Obviously, the British Social Attitudes Survey is something that we at Humanist UK uh, make regular use of and like to refer to its work because um, it's very, very good um, when it comes to religion. Um, her policy background lies mainly in welfare reform, labour market policies and employment, uh, but she's really interested in apostasy and has been developing research ideas about it, um, which she will be telling us about in due course. Um, so uh, with that said, and without further ado, over to you, Lily. Um, so hi, I'm Lily. I'm the Advocacy Officer at Humanist International. As you probably gathered, I'm not from a research background myself, but I hope through um, my work in international advocacy and campaigns, I would like to give you an idea of the situation for apostates outside of the UK, particularly looking at how uh, anti-apostasy laws are frequently misused, not only to undermine freedom of religion or belief, for the non-religious and for people who leave their religion, but uh, are also abused to uh, penalize anyone who tends to hold or express views that differ from, from those in power. Uh, I'll tell some stories of cases we've intervened in over the years uh, where an individual has been charged uh, with breaching anti-apostasy and anti-blasphemy laws. And I'll end with some thoughts as to the um, future of human rights for apostates and where I think we should really be focusing on uh, to bring about much needed change and reform. So the foundation stone for a lot of humanist international work to support apostates uh, is the Freedom of Thought Report. Uh, this comes out every year. It's a global survey where we measure how the non-religious and that's inclusive of apostates are treated in every country around the world. Uh, we conduct the study through the lens of uh, how free legislation, the judicial system, the education system and other public bodies are from religious influence. And we also tried to infuse in the study uh, an examination of the kind of social treatment of the non-religious as well. Uh, but the way the study is conducted is primarily looking at uh, systems rather than lived experience and the limitation being that uh, we don't have uh, that many in-country researchers uh, to rely on. Um, Oh, and before I proceed, I also wanted to reissue the content warning and just remind people that this is, you know, uh, heavy and a difficult subject and to feel free to take a break if, if they do need to, to do so. Uh, to, so to start with kind of a high level overview of uh, laws against apostasy. 
through the Freedom of Thought report, we have found that there are between 20 and 30 countries where apostasy is against the law. It's hard to pin down an exact number because the law is not always reflective of reality. Apostasy is one of those crimes where uh, if a religious court is determined enough and has discretion, they can probably charge someone with it, even if it's not explicit in the penal code. Uh, 10 of that selection of countries where apostasy is illegal, illegal are uh, those where it is punishable by death. And you can, you can see uh, those 10 countries on the slide. All of those countries follow Sharia law. Uh, and in each, uh, as you might expect, it's basically impossible to live outwardly as a non-religious individual, to express your doubts about religion, with, or question religious tenets, or to joke about religion uh, without bringing severe repercussions for your, your life, uh, your liberty, and your safety. The uh, human rights violations justified by anti-apostasy laws tend to be some of the most extreme and cruel attacks on individual freedom that we see uh, around the world. On top of that, being outed as an apostate can also involve being legally discriminated against in, in various ways, such as having your property confiscated, uh, losing your job, or uh, having your marriage annulled, for example, uh, and, and that all being uh, allowed within the legal system. It can have consequences for freedom of association. If you just if you want to form an atheist or a humanist organization, it's likely that uh, members may be subject to harassment, uh, investigation, or perhaps uh, maybe shut down. Very commonly charged alongside uh, apostasy are uh, laws punishing the act of blasphemy, or religious defamation, or or religious insult. Anti-blasphemy laws are equally problematic and also heavily abused because they are based on a very subjective idea of uh, what constitutes offence. The problem with both anti-apostasy and anti-blasphemy laws is that they are a direct violation of an individual's freedom of religion of belief and very often their freedom of expression as well. But on top of that, they also legitimize many private acts of intolerance and stigma that can be incredibly damaging to somebody's uh, well-being and to their relationships. For the non-religious, uh, we most commonly see that persecution and abuse tends to happen from uh, within the family. These laws also embolden would-be perpetrators of mob violence and encourage them to carry out uh, harmful acts with impunity. The fact that apostasy uh, is outlawed, it easily becomes a justification for um, vigilantes to feel like they are performing a uh, a form of justice on behalf of the state or carrying out some sort of religious duty. And very often the state will corroborate this view by failing to charge the perpetrator with any, with any offense. Uh, so the first thing to note about uh, the effect of these laws is that they have an incredibly wide reach. So they intend to target not just people who reject religion, but actually anyone who is a dissenter or a potential enemy of the, of the state because of who they are or what they do. Many victims of anti-apostasy laws are targeted, not because of their beliefs per se, but because of the fact that they are proponents for uh, progressive social reforms, because they might speak out uh, against the oppression of women or in favor of LGBTI rights or other minorities, or, or because they advocate against uh, harmful traditional practices that uh, can be linked to religion, such as uh, forced marriage, honor crimes, uh, or caste discrimination. They might uh, even be a religious uh, individual, but seen as insufficiently religious because they don't fast or they don't wear religious clothing or because they don't pray enough. They could be an artist or a poet whose art is seen as too political or, or too radical. And they could also be accused on the basis of a purely malicious attack uh, because of a personal dispute, for example, and because the stigma associated with apostasy is so strong, it's, it's very open to, open to abuse. And that's, it's, that's something that we see. Religious minorities in some cases can also fall victim to anti-apostasy laws if uh, the particular way of realizing their religious beliefs is opposed by the majority, for example, Ahmadi Muslim, Muslims in uh, Pakistan or Baha'is in, in Iran are considered apostates in those countries. So uh, overall, while, while states argue that anti-apostasy and anti-blasphemy laws are there in order to ensure social harmony and, and order, what we tend to see is that they in fact produce the complete opposite effect and that they are there primarily to police communities 
and to silence the possibility of uh, critical thought. Uh, certain governments in the past, uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, uh, for example, have made statements where they have equated apostates to terrorists and the spread of atheist ideas is posing as existential threat to the security of the nation. I wanted to mention a few cases of ours as well to illustrate uh, some of the points that I was making about uh, the victims of anti-apostasy laws. So uh, Sheikh Maktir uh, is, a, is a wonderful um, activist in Mauritania. He was born into uh, what is considered to be an untouchable caste. Uh, and here are some of his words on the slide describing what happened to him uh, in a recent interview. It all started when he wrote an article uh, criticizing Mauritania's caste discrimination system, which is so severe that it, that it in fact amounts to a form of uh, slavery with members of the uh, Haratine class who tend to be Mauritanians of African descent, uh, only being allowed to perform uh, very restricted jobs, uh, menial labor for, for no compensation. Uh, and in the article, Sheikh linked these uh, practices which have been embedded in Mauritania's culture for a long time to Islamic scripture. As a result, he was charged with apostasy and sentenced to death. He ended up spending six years behind bars, uh, much of it in solitary confinement. Uh, but thankfully, he has uh, now found safety overseas, in part due to the work of uh, NGOs lobbying hard for his release. And nowadays, he continues to invest his time to speak out against, speak out against human rights abuses in Mauritania. Another case we've worked on uh, is that of Ashraf Fayad. Uh, he's a well-known case. Uh, Ashraf is currently imprisoned, uh, being sentenced to death initially for his poetry, a sample of which you can uh, read on the screen. Interestingly, a lot of the themes of his poetry aren't actually about uh, atheism uh, or religion, but uh, about the politics of oil and about uh, poverty in Saudi Arabia. He was accused by someone initially that he'd had a personal falling out with, uh, and who wanted to see him punished. The, what strikes me that in that case is that the evidence that was used against him was uh, the fact that he had long hair and the fact that he had photographs of women on his phone. Uh, and that's a common feature of a lot of trials uh, against apostates, which is that they're usually marred by incredible uh, procedural irregularities. And the outcome is usually predetermined before the trial even begins and the evidence used uh, random and uh, irrelevant. Judges and lawyers are sometimes also compromised uh, because of their personal feelings in the case or because they fear uh, retribution being taken against them if they're seen to associate with uh, an apostate or an accused apostate uh, or a blasphemer. Uh, Mahmoud is a Muslim academic from Somalia uh, who wrote on Facebook a post about whether it made sense to pray to God to end the season of drought. Uh, he was accused uh, on the back of that post of insulting God and of insulting the religious ritual of prayer, uh, i.e. he was accused of blasphemy uh, and he started to receive a lot of death threats and he was accused of being an apostate uh, by a local preacher despite uh, being a Muslim himself. He was sentenced to two and a half years in prison uh, before receiving a presidential pardon this year, but on the basis that he no longer write or speak uh, publicly about his beliefs, i.e. he was asked to censor himself and his ideas. The good news is that Mahmoud and his family have been able to relocate, uh, and we were so pleased to be able to support him to be able to do that. So what next in terms of uh, where can we go to improve the situation for apostates? Uh, I think the answer needs to go a bit beyond campaigning for the repeal of anti-apostasy laws, uh, although that's very important and a big part of what we do. I think we have to also be realistic that uh, these sorts of reforms are not going to be on the radar or priority for uh, Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. Um, although sometimes we do see uh, changes that are surprising, for instance, uh, Sudan, which used to punish apostasy with death, um, changed its position recently. Um, but usually these reforms would come as part of a wider process uh, and greater kind of acceptance of kind of secular principles and after a period of uh, perhaps upheaval or, or, or conflict or uh, transition, which is something that's kind of out of the control of 
individual campaigners, uh, I think. Uh, so where to focus our efforts? I've highlighted here kind of three areas that uh, I think are very important uh, to keep in mind as, as, as positive, uh, positive areas. Um, I think we always have to remind ourselves that you know, the force of human rights is on our sides. Uh, you know, apostasy is a human right, blasphemy is a human right, and these are enforceable human rights. Uh, it's very important for everyone to be familiar with that um, and it, to be taught in schools as far as possible, I think. I think that internalizing that message can be important for you know, individual welfare and having knowledge of human rights language uh, can be empowering for the individual. You know, instead of considering yourself or being told that you are uh, you know, morally deviant or a sinner for uh, being a non-believer, you can rely on the fact that instead you're a human being exercising your right to believe as you will, which is a right granted to everybody. But I think also literacy on uh, in human rights on an individual level uh, should really be matched as well by more efforts uh, internationally and, and locally to achieve a greater understanding of those who wish to change or to reject their religious beliefs and you know really how difficult um, how difficult that is. Um, so I think the key is, uh, as, as many have said today, you know, more sociological research on the number of apostates, the psychological difficulties they confront and the complex social pressures that they are subjected to and how damaging it can be to have to hide your beliefs and to live in fear. I think we need to hear uh, more of these stories because you know, they help others and they help to build social consciousness. Uh, and you know, in particular, I think, uh, as we may go on to talk a little bit about the right to asylum, I think that that's uh, very relevant when it comes to uh, the asylum claims from uh, non-religious people. Uh, the third focal point uh, from the advocacy perspective is that uh, there needs to be more political pressure applied by states who claim to uh, respect human rights, particularly freedom of religion or belief, to adopt a tougher standpoint against those that don't respect basic human rights and liberties. Uh, for example, I think human rights should be central to uh, trade negotiations and agreements uh, and you know, where money is being exchanged. I think that there should be accountability for what that money is being used for. Uh, obviously, you know, being very idealistic, um, what, we, what would be great to aim for is a kind of mentality shift for states that do enforce apostasy laws to have uh, to come towards an understanding that you know introducing debate and, and critical thinking in, in a society isn't is a threat, but it's a way of actually building a more resilient society and that you know intellectual and artistic freedom uh, thriving uh, is is a good thing. I think ideas are stronger when they are contested and when they are challenged and not when they're imposed from above. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Completely agree with your point at the end there, uh, Lily. Um, I, I, should, I should add as well that um, if you want to ask questions, then please do so in the Q&A, uh, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. I see some questions have already come in. Uh, with that said, uh, over to you, Nilitha. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so as Richie said, I'm from Natsen. Um, we're an independent social research organization. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we've been around for over 50 years and we work on behalf of government and charities to find out what people think about important social issues and how Britain is run. The work that we do includes large and small scale surveys, including Understanding Society and the British Social Attitude Survey, as well as qualitative research and evaluation on a range of topics. I do want to hold my hands up and say that we haven't done a lot of work on religion or apostasy ourselves, um, but we are very interested in the area. And so I wanted to say a bit about the work that we have done and the gaps that we've identified and think need addressing with robust evidence. Um, so firstly, Natsen has been conducting this British Social Attitude Survey since 1983, which tracks the views and opinions of the public on issues facing the nation, such as um, health, education, housing, and religion. Um, the 36th edition of the British Social Attitude Survey report looked at religion, exploring identity, behavior, and belief. 
Um, so this graph um, from that survey report illustrates that over time there's been a dramatic decline in the proportion of people who identify with Christianity, along with a substantial increase in those with no religious affiliation and a steady increase in those belonging to non-Christian faiths. Um, it should be noted that most of the shift in the religious profile of the nation has been towards non-affiliation, with 52% of the public now saying they don't regard themselves as belonging to any religion. And of these, most were simply not simply not brought up. Um, most were simply not brought up with a religion, with a smaller minority having lost a childhood faith. Those who do not regard themselves as belonging to a religion are increasingly secular, um, so likely to say that they are very or extremely unreligious. And the number of people with no religion who were not brought up in one has increased from 11% in 1998 to 23% in 2018. So with this general decline in religious faith, um, we still know very little about apostates in particular, um, who are defined as not only experiencing loss of faith, but active rejection or denunciation of religion. So are a very specific group that our survey, survey doesn't measure. And while we have a growing body of literature on apostasy, knowing more about apostate numbers and understanding more about them and their experiences is a key evidence need for the future. Um, we believe this evidence is important because of the known difficulties that apostates experience, which are already highlighted in research evidence and include, but are of course not limited to risks such as homelessness, problems in education, access to social services and refugee and asylum support services and mental health issues. And these risks are echoed in that sense own in depth qualitative research with groups facing similar issues. Um, for example, in a study on homelessness amongst gay and lesbian youth, similar impacts were seen on people's housing situation and mental health. So um, that research kind of also really highlights the importance of support services who recognise and understand apostasy and of understanding the support needs of apostates. Um, recognising that we wanted to highlight a number of gaps in the UK evidence base. Um, so as I mentioned, in terms of the number of apostates, um, we don't sort of have a precise measure and exact, exact prevalence estimate um, of the number overall and then also of those at risk of leaving high control religious groups. And with this being a likely low prevalence group, um, this will be challenging um, to measure in a, an accurate way. But there is a question as to how exact uh, an estimate would need to be as opposed to us simply having more robust research evidence on apostates, um, including experiences of apostates from different um, diverse religious backgrounds, um, the stages in the journey of religious disaffiliation, um, including what issues affect people at different stages, when they're most vulnerable, when they would benefit from external support, what support apostates themselves need, how well different types of support work and for whom, and how support services can recognise and identify apostates and better support them. Um, and other themes that would be interesting to explore um, are ways in which um, apostates journey has been shaped by technology, um, which we know plays an important role, and their experiences of living through the pandemic. Thank you, and I will stop sharing. Thank you, that's great. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, and I will come back to ask you some questions about it in a minute. Um, first, be before I before I, we move on to the questions, I, I'm going to say a bit about what Humanist UK um, has been doing uh, around uh, around um, uh, apostasy, what, what we've been doing with Faith to Faithless um, to support apostates. 
a large uh, part of Humus UK's work and face-to-face -face services work, and this is very important in itself, um, is simply educating people about the, uh, the, the needs of apostates, um, whether that be um, different social service providers, local authorities, um, other um, uh, you know, third sector providers like um, children's support charities um, or uh, the police uh, or uh, different uh, bits of different central government departments. Uh, we've done a lot of work training different people in, in the needs of apostates um, and um, how those needs can best be met. Um, and that in itself is something that shouldn't be discounted. Um, we've also done some uh, policy work on some areas where there are particular issues. Um, so we've done a lot of work on asylum. I noticed that one person asked a question about that in the chat. Um, we did some work um, three years ago now, three and a half years ago, um, with an asylum seeker um, called Hamza bin Waliat after he was told that he would not be granted asylum because he failed to name uh, Plato and Aristotle as humanists during his asylum interview. Um, now, there are all sorts of problems with that. Um, the fact that Plato and Aristotle were not humanists is, is, is one of them. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, it's also obviously a completely inappropriate um, type of question to be asking and expect uh, someone to know the answer to uh, because, you know, that kind of uh, wrote knowledge is not the kind of thing that, that humanists might be expected to have, not least of all someone who grew up um, in Pakistan and so may not have a, no a detailed knowledge of uh, the Western philosophical canon. Um, and, but we did a big campaign um, off the back of what happened with him, um, which ultimately culminated in the Home Office deciding to introduce a new compulsory day-long training course for all of its asylum assessors on freedom of religion or belief. Um, which uh, we helped write. Um, we, we did that in partnership with various religious groups um, and um, other interested stakeholders. Um, and then once the, uh, the, um, the uh, materials uh, were written, we then helped deliver the training. Uh, I and um, several colleagues of mine um, traveled um, to different asylum uh, assess assessor centers in the, around the country um, to train uh, asylum assessors um, and talk to them about how they should assess non-religious claims. Um, uh, over the last uh, three or four years, we've been running an asylum support program. Um, uh, over that time, we've helped about 50 asylum seekers, uh, 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 about 35 or 36 or so um, have now had their cases concluded. And um, I'm pleased to say that every single one of them so far has uh, gained asylum. Um, so um, that's uh, been very successful. And that support means um, uh, assessing whether or not we think their claim, uh, it might be genuine. Um, uh, outlining the situation that uh, non-religious people face in their countries of origin and what kind of persecution they may face if, if they are deported um, and um, documenting that in a letter um, of support um, and also um, uh, sometimes uh, every you know a few times a year attending uh, immigration tribunal hearings to give oral evidence um, just this week, um, we have, of course, um, been uh, working, uh, talking to the Home Office about the situation in Afghanistan and the need for non-religious asylum claimants um, to be um, uh, to be prioritised amongst those who uh, are able to um, gain asylum in in the UK, um, uh, because um, Afghanistan is one of those countries where uh, apostasy and blasphemy uh, carry the death cell penalty and that was true even before uh, the events of last week so the situation there um, is very grave. We also do a lot of work um, lobbying um, the UK's Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office um, and uh, working through the UK Parliament um, to uh, raise the plight of uh, non-religious asylum claimants, uh, sorry non-religious people abroad um, that face persecution um, both individual humanist at risk and pushing for uh, wider legal change, much along the lines of what Lily uh, talked about uh, in her presentation, very much working in support of Humanist International's agenda. Um, we uh, ha ha have uh, been, we fed into the um, Commission for Countering Extremism that was run by Sarah Khan um, and um, have uh, done lots of work on the government's integrated strategy 
um, the green paper that came out a few years ago, um, where obviously um, the needs of apostates are a strong angle. Um, and we also do a lot of work on uh, education, uh, where we've got a full time dedicated member of staff working at, to address issues around uh, religion and education, um, which span from um, the fact that, you know, it's routinely the case that a, a child may be attending a faith school um, that their parents have um, got them into. And that child may decide that actually they don't believe in um, uh, the religion of the school. And yet, nonetheless, they're still compelled to. Um, to take part in acts of worship and um, faith-based religious education um, through to the fact that there are lots of problems with uh, illegal schools um, in England. Um, so we've done a lot of work uh, with uh, people who've attended illegal or private religious schools um, and um, have amplified their voices and experiences lobbying for change. Uh, we've worked in particular with um, lots of people who went to the illegal Haredi Jewish schools that operate in Stamford Hill, uh, where estimates are that there are as many as uh, 6,000 children um, who are attending schools that are so bad they don't even meet the minimum standards of private schools, and yet still they're operating uh, full time, um, uh, basically forcing the pupils attending them to uh, learn to recite the Talmud and the Torah um, all day, every day, um, except um, for um, Saturdays um, and um, uh, the government has uh, is planning to introduce new legislation to close those schools down but that's been repeatedly delayed um, for a number of years um, and it's something that we're pushing to uh, see happen as soon as possible because I think issues around right to education are one of the biggest um, kind of problems that um, haven't you know that need to be addressed uh, when it comes to the needs of apostates. Um, so with that said, um, I think uh, we should move on to the Q&A um, and um, thanks to those who've asked questions in the chat already um, and I encourage, I'd encourage more people to ask more questions, um, but before uh, we do that, I wondered if I could ask Lily a question to start with. Um, Lily, I wondered if you might want to say more, I'd be interested to hear more about um, whether or not or how the experience of apostates has changed around the world during the pandemic. Yeah, I think um, the COVID-19 pandemic has ha had a very serious impact on uh, apostates around the world. Uh, in some places, the pandemic uh, itself has been regarded as a, a or painted as a punishment uh, from from God for, for acts of blasphemy. I think, uh, generally speaking, the fact that you know, as a result of national lockdowns, a lot of um, people have been stuck at home, have been uh, forced to pray. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we, we, the most cases of apostate abuse that we see are those that take place uh, within the home. Uh, and I think the fact that people are, um, you know, going to be uh, more stuck in those uh, situations, you know, makes them ever more vulnerable. Um, and I think as of right now, we haven't seen, I think the rise in, uh, you know, apostates reaching out to us for support. I think that will probably come, uh, come in the months to come. But yeah, I think the pandemic has had a, uh, will have, certainly have had effects. Thank you. And uh, Nilifa, I wanted to ask you a question as well. Um, you mentioned towards the end of your uh, talk, your slides about how technology um, might have changed things for apostates and obviously you mentioned that as an area of uh, future research in particular um, but uh, that's a very interesting point and I wondered if you might expand on that say what you think if such research were conducted it would be likely to show or might show. I think that is a really good question and, and yeah an area that we're really interested um, to explore given that the internet is a key route to, you know, access networks that you um, may not be able to and probably couldn't during the pandemic um, and get in touch with like minded people and also access services. So we know that the internet is is really important and um, may have played a greater role during the pandemic when access to wider networks has been more limited uh, to us all. Um, and certainly without the internet would have been more so. Um, it's difficult to preempt what kind of research 
evidence might reveal on this. Um, so yeah, I just think it, it's a, a really key area, it will be a really interesting area to kind of look at that further, and particularly um, through the lens of the pandemic, both in terms of documenting what has happened and the kind of channels that might have opened up for people and the services or support they may have received. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn to questions in the chat. I see that there's one question about asylum. I think I've now already answered that. Uh, I suppose I could add to what I said earlier. Um, uh, it, one problem we do sometimes see is that the refugee convention itself is phrased in terms of religion. Um, and obviously that on the face of it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that non-religious people should um, gain asylum. Now, um, wider human rights conventions uh, dictate that references to religion should be read as inclusive of the non-religious, um, uh, but it's unfortunate that's a point that we have to keep uh, making. Um, Lily, do you want to say anything about, so the question is about experience of apostasy and asylum. Um, I wondered if you want to, might want to say anything about that internationally. What the yeah, sure, sure. I think uh, overall, um, the issues with apostates in the asylum system are, you know, tend to be replicated around the world, and that being that there is no parity in the asylum system when it comes to um, people from non-religious backgrounds versus people from uh, or, or religious asylum seekers. Um, so, you know, there have been cases where uh, uh, an asylum claim has been rejected, and the court has said that, you know. Um, you can go back to your home country and keep your keep a low profile. You have no need to openly express uh, your um, non-religious non-religious views, and that's not something that you would tell, you know, a Christian asylum seeker. So I think you know non-believers are um, disproportionately punished in the asylum system because it's you know not seen as necessarily that they outwardly manifest their beliefs, and that just comes from a misunderstanding of of uh, the right of freedom of religion uh, or belief. Um, I think another issue is the fact that um, there tend, it's the same with kind of uh, LGBTI asylum seekers, for instance, where um, it's their, their credibility overall uh, as you know a, a non-religious asylum seeker is doubted. Um, so I think I'd read about a case uh, in the UK where you know the Home Office told an applicant that um, who was from Sudan that you know there's no evidence of atheism in Sudan uh, and because there's no conclusion that, that there's no atheist in the country you know it's, it's not possible that you're going to be persecuted for being an atheist um yeah and as you mentioned inappropriate knowledge testing uh is also something that uh we see come up a lot um and I think that you know the solution to that um I would you know really recommend you know there being um a lot more research being uh, conducted into um, the situation of the non-religious in, in countries where they where they are persecuted. Yeah, I, I think the, the the point about burden of proof in terms of uh, extent of persecution is an interesting one because it can be much harder, as, as, as you said, Lily, to, pr to prove uh, that such persecution happens when it's been so total that it's impossible for there to be an openly non-religious community at all in a certain country. There's a paradox there that the fact the absence of any such community, because it's basically stamped out as soon as it come as soon as someone tries to raise their head above the parapet, means that there's not you know you don't ever get the situation like you do, where for example um, in parts of Nigeria you see um, churches being burned down and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and in parts of Ethiopia, you're seeing mass killings of people because of their beliefs, or you know the, the large persecution of the Uyghurs in in uh, Rohingya. Like you, you can't get that in many parts of the world for the non-religious because there just simply can't be that many people together in the first place. And um, we're a bit concerned actually in the UK about the uh, new plan for immigration that's recently been announced, consulted on, and then had a bill introduced um, uh, where it's going to raise the threshold of evidence in a way that I know that uh, a colleague of mine who deals with our asylum work is worried that it may make it harder for non-religious people to gain asylum. Um, so that's definitely a real concern. Um, the next question is from someone called Jimmy. I wonder whether or not that's uh, Jimmy Bangler, who's part of Faith to Faithless. Um, he asked whether we have any thoughts on the, ter on the term Islamophobia um, and questions whether or not it's sometimes used to um, 
silence people simply for speaking out against Islam, like, for example, apostates. Um, and uh, is that a problem and should we be combating it? Do either of you want to come in on that? Uh, I could say a little bit. Um, I think that there is an issue with the term Islamophobia in itself and that it, uh, it centers Islam and it centers um, religion. So I know that as, our, uh, as an organization, we tend to emphasize instead the term uh, anti-Muslim bigotry. Um, and I think, how do we combat this? I think it starts with acknowledging that uh, anti-Muslim bigotry and uh, hate crimes against Muslim, you know, Muslims, that, that, that is a significant issue, but it's a, it's a separate issue from the criticism of uh, religions. And you know it's problematic when uh, governments try and uh, make it um, a state policy that you know religions don't have a right to be um, uh, don't have a right to be criticized. Um, uh, if the Rabat Plan of Action is uh, has is a useful document offering guidelines of you know when speech that is is critical of religion you know, crosses the line to become hate speech. Uh, and, and what it does is it imposes a very high threshold uh, for, um, you know, taking into account, you know, what was said and and uh, the you know, uh, the content of, of of the speech itself. But I think, yeah, I think that there is a difficulty when you have, you know, a genuine need to uh, combat uh, hate speech and discrimination in society, and and also the need to be able to uh, speak out and criticize. Uh, uh, particular uh, religious practices. Nilifa, would you like to add anything or shall I keep going? No? Okay. Um, yeah, so there have been various definitions of Islamophobia proposed within the UK, um, some of which have uh, questionably gone on the wrong side of that in terms of um, got on the wrong side of things in terms of potentially shutting down criticism of Islam and as Lily says, there are serious problems with uh, discrimination against and persecution of Muslims, um, uh, both within the UK and around the world. And that absolutely should not be discounted, but any definition that's come up with does need to make sure that it uh, allows, you know, criticism of a religion. Um, the problem is when it comes to um, discrimination against adherents of a particular religion, uh, which is what I think needs to be avoided. Um, uh, we've then got a question uh, uh, suggesting that under uh, it, that apostasy is a hooded offence under all codes of the Sharia, uh, Sunni or Shia, uh, which means that ex-Muslims as a group fall under the Genocide Convention as a group, which makes all Muslim clerics supportive of laws codes that are genocidal in their intent towards Muslim apostates. And is that an argument that's been made internationally? Um, maybe I should try and answer that one. I think the difficulty is that when it comes to any religion, uh, whether that be Islam or any other religion, of course, um, not all adherents to that religion or all states um, follow um, that um, particular, uh, you know, a particular one particular interpretation of it, even if religious texts might clearly say one particular thing. So there are many states around the world, for example, um, where um, Islam is the predominant religion of the population, but um, nonetheless, um, the state does not uh, criminalize blasphemy or apostasy. Um, and so this chain of logic doesn't actually apply um, in that case. So obviously you have to take everything on a case by case basis, depending on the laws of a particular state and how the population uh, behaves. Um, uh, clearly, you know, if a particular uh, state um, says, um, you know, acts or says in a says a certain thing and it bases what it's doing on on particular religious arguments, then of course, in, in, in that case, um, then, you know, that is an argument that can be made with regard to the behaviour of that case and, and, and one that we make can, you know, Humanist International also makes, but I don't think it's possible to generalize when it comes to any one particular religion. Um, I don't, I think, uh, I, I don't think, I don't imagine either of you two have anything to add to that. Um, Just that, that that book sounds interesting uh, and I will, I will 
check it out. I think I think one one instance uh, just to give an example of where that might possibly apply. Uh, you know, if the Taliban were to embark on a policy to eliminate uh, atheists um, on yeah. the basis of their belief, um, then in that very specific, you know, situation, um, then the international court could maybe investigate for crimes of genocide. There are lots of evidentiary difficulties with that. Uh, not least, you know, getting anyone at the Taliban to appear before the court itself. But um, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a. Um, interesting theoretical question but uh, would have practical difficulties yeah and um, the book referred to just to be clear because it's in the question which i don't know that the our attendees can see is one uh -huh. by robertson of doughty street chambers who's written a book called mullers without mercy he is he is a well re highly regarded um human rights barrister um so um, the next question is for you, Nilifer. It's from Sarah Jane Page. Um, the question asks, how does the BSA decide on its research priorities and what is the likelihood of getting statistical data on apostasy rates in the near future, given the challenges of generating a sample? That I think is a very good question. Um, yep, so uh, in terms of the way we decide uh, research priorities, um, BSA collects uh, quantitative data on a really wide range of topics. So. Um, every year we sort of get together and think about what key topical issues um, there are. So um, past reports or recent reports have um, had a lot of focus on Brexit. Um, we have funders as well who approach us with um, research priorities. And so in conversation with them, we'll decide our, um, our research priorities for the, the uh, survey report for the coming year. Um, in terms of the likelihood of getting statistical data on apostasy, given the challenges of generating a sample. So um, from hearing everything that's coming through from this conference and the roundtable discussions, um, I do very much hope that this issue is kind of gaining traction and attention. Um, and I think it's really up to us in the research community to develop strong methodology really um, around how we could do this and um, yes it's it is a really challenging thing to do quantitatively um, getting an accurate prevalence estimate um, but there are kind of methods that um, may provide us with a, a less accurate uh, estimate but a reasonable one that we kind of could utilize um, and I suppose qualitative research where um, my kind of heart lies uh, offers more opportunities because you're uh, able to generate a sample more easily, but you can't provide kind of quantitative um, figures. But I think qualitative research could um, give us lots of scope for really understanding in depth the sorts of issues that are are facing people. So um, it's an area that we've been thinking a lot about um, and that we hope the research community is, is also doing um, and that I hope to see more kind of robust research evidence on in the future. Thank you. Uh, I know that the uh, British Social Attitude Survey asks every year about religion of upbringing versus, uh, you know, current uh, religious belonging, and uh, that I think is, I think it's the largest survey to do that. So um, looking at that data, I think is actually quite useful in terms of working out how many people have left a uh, religion. Now, obviously, um, uh, not everybody who leaves a religion or has a religious upbringing. Would necessarily be or would classify themselves as an apostate but that data is really useful and i know that faith to faithless does make use of it um we've got a simple question will the conference be available to rewatch online um yes um straightforwardly it will um uh, it's going to take a while um but um uh, we will be uploading it in due course um i've also got a question here um as to um whether or not, uh, well, what, whether um, either of you might like to reflect on the situation on, in Afghanistan at all more. I said something earlier about the work that we've been doing at Humanist UK, but I know that Humanist International has been doing quite a lot of work on it over the last week. And Lily, did you want to say something about that? Yeah, um, I, I, sh I share everyone's uh, sentiments that the situation in Afghanistan is uh, really, really heartbreaking for, for a lot of people. Um, 
and uh, a very concerning situation for you know human rights defenders, for for women, for the non-religious, for religious and ethnic minorities. I think the focus right now for us as uh, as an organization is um, lobbying for uh, humanitarian uh, relief and for uh, routes to asylum to remain open and for you know the states that have, are able to and have a responsibility to to you know go in and uh, to rescue people that you know may become uh, targets of the Taliban in future it's uh, yeah been kind of it's a situation that we're going to be dealing with for the repercussions with for a, a long time I, I think um, yeah yeah absolutely Lefa, do you want to add anything no okay fine um, Another question I've got here um, is um, to both of you, what do you think the most urgent data uh, needed? Uh, what do you think is the most urgent data needed um, for policymakers around apostasy? Um, and, uh, where, and secondly, where might you hope that we get to in a few years time um, when it comes to uh, meeting the needs of apostates and the human rights of apostates? And um, for me, I think um, recognizing um, apostasy um, is going to be really important across the different services that apostates might need. So recognizing the signs, because it may not always be obvious and people may not want to disclose. Um, and then being able to kind of shape services on, on that basis, I think, would be an important one. Um, for me, um, from, from from the global angle, I think having you know uh, just more data and testimonials from non-religious worldwide uh, because of you know the issues that mentioned in the uh, the asylum system. Um, you know, with as, uh, with the Freedom of Thought report, we we cover laws, but there's uh, potential for it to be so much richer and for for us to have a lot more um, qualitative data there uh, from derived from individual experience. I would love to see that. In the future but uh, we are quite a small organization as it is um, and I think as well uh, having spoken to the, the person with our, at our organization that's specifically responsible for uh, working on a casework uh, she would like to see um, more research and this is kind of a practical suggestion more research on service providers uh, and frontline services who would be you know good to refer people to uh, in different countries and um, so you know how to avoid referring somebody to uh, a faith-based service provider uh, for instance um, and that's something that I think that she uh, sometimes you know finds it hard uh, because there isn't that database yet that exists of um, specifically with respect to uh, the non-religious. Well you may you may just be able to hear in the background that my partner has just set up the smoke alarm so I apologize if that's interrupted that <laughs> seminar um, I've got one of those smoke alarms that talks to you when you're having the problem um, anyway right um, <laughs> continuing um, I, yeah I think uh, that's a really good point Lily that um, a lot of the um, service provision like I, I think often that some of the service uh, some of the funds that things that things that the FCDO here in the UK funds are um, uh, 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 a faith-based service providers who might uh, discriminate in terms of how they provide their service in the way that I think you know we should try and get a, get away from and that uh, shouldn't be acceptable in the UK um, as well as um, as well as uh, uh, never mind about abroad. Um, I also think that there's some quite interesting work to be done to estimate the number of non-religious people in a lot of countries around the world and I know there's some interesting research being done into that at the moment using um, various uh, techniques to get people to be willing to admit that they are non-religious in a statistically reliable way without actually having to directly say it, and which in many countries is really important. I know there are a couple of academics in the United States, I think, and Canada who are doing work on that at the moment. It'll be very interesting to see what they find. Um, I have one more question here um, that says, um, rather than generalise, is it useful to be specific um, and look at data and specify which religion most apostasy cases involving violence and appeals for refugee status stem from? Do we see it happening with one religion more than others? Um, uh, and that could help with resource allocation. 
Um, so um, I think our experience when it comes to people we help with asylum is that they're overwhelmingly claiming asylum uh, from countries um, that uh, are uh, Muslim majority and that um, uh, criminalize blasphemy or apostasy. Um, that's not to say that they are um, necessarily ex-Muslims, certainly not, um, but they tend to come from uh, countries like uh, those that Lily highlighted, where there's a death penalty, um, or also other countries where there's very serious um, social persecution, like uh, Bangladesh, uh, where uh, there's not the death penalty for blasphemy and apostasy, but many uh, humorous bloggers have been killed in recent years. Um, but that's not to say, of course, that those are that those are the people who make up uh, uh, the overwhelming majority or all apostates in general. Um, so uh, thinking about faith to faith, a lot of the work it does is with um, ex, uh, ex Jewish people, ex um, Jehovah's Witnesses, ex um, exclusive brethren, ex evangelical Christians. So um, it, it's much more diverse um, than that um, uh, in, in terms of the UK population um, and, and the needs uh, that need to be met. Um, and I think Faith to Faithless does a very good job of bringing together all those different people from different religious backgrounds and, and finding the commonality and how they can support each other. Um, there's uh, lots of support groups that are focused on particular religions, but also um, having a, a, a kind of pan <laughs> faith uh, group, I think, um, is, is, uh, is really valuable. Um, do either of you want to add anything um, to that? Yeah, just to just to agree that uh, in our experience, I think the overwhelming majority would be ex uh, or, or asylum seekers from Muslim majority countries because uh, the asylum process requires evidence of uh, state persecution, I suppose, uh, and you know because of laws against apostasy and things like that. I see that. Um, uh... Terry, one of Faith to Faces, well, Faith to Faces is coordinator, in fact, has uh, put in the chat uh, that uh, there's a member of Faith to Faces who uh, she knows who gained um, asylum in the UK because of um, uh, threats they faced, death threats they faced after being an apostate from Christianity in Nigeria, um, uh, presumably um, in uh, some of the more Christian bits of Nigeria. So there you go. Um, so I think that just about uh, leads leads our panel to its conclusion. Uh, Lily or Nifa, do you want to add any final thoughts or remarks? Just that it's been a pleasure to join today and to hear from everybody's experiences. I've learned a lot and I've found a lot of things very moving and very uh, inspiring. So thank you for having me. Yeah, and, and I echo that. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much to both of you um, for uh, your contributions. Very interesting and informative. And uh, thank you to everybody who's attending. Um, now I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, Claire, um, Humanist UK's Head of Humanist Care, um, who's going to wrap the conference up. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richie. Um, so as we bring the conference to a close, um, I must say again how great it's been to have so many people here. We've had a really wonderful illustration today from all our speakers of everything that's needed and why, um, and some really constructive suggestions for future directions. We've seen today as the beginning of conversations, not the end, um, and we hope this is going to spark some research and some revision of services and policy and practice right across the UK and hopefully beyond. I would like to give my heartfelt thanks to all our speakers, um, people who've shared their academic and personal experiences with really touching vulnerability and such clear dedication to survivors. We've heard insightful, challenging and thought provoking presentations today spanning right across all aspects of apostasy. And we've seen the incredible hope for the future. Faith to Faithless is moving into a new phase of growth with our first dedicated full-time manager starting in a couple of weeks and the scoping of a helpline service and this conference provides some really excellent momentum for the sector and connections that we can build on. So thanks to everyone for coming. We do have a donate button in the chat as it's really important to us to keep things free at the point of service wherever we can but if anyone would like to support our work we have a link in there now. 
We're going to take the rich conversations from the roundtables and the sessions today and create a report which we'll release in the autumn. But in the meantime, please do get in touch if you want to have a conversation with us, if you're interested in our training for professionals and services, or if you want to know a bit more about how you can support apostates. So as we close, just a final thank you to all our speakers and to each and every one of you who have attended today and if you've attended the roundtables prior to today as well. Have a great evening and we hope to see you all again soon.